from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan. It's the Grace and Paul Potts cast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. Right on. Right on. <laughs> All right. So, um, good week? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Like, uh, after all of a sudden, it was, it was, it was good, you know? Uh, we're uh, g- we're going to make it good. I kept, I'm kept i preparing down here. I'm getting the recording set up, mm-hmm. and I keep hearing uh, from upstairs this screaming and yelling. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, you know, it's going well. The, the laundry got finished, which, you know. Praise God from, from whom all blessings, blessings flow. flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Sorry for the pitching, the, the pitch. Uh, <laughs> My auto tune didn't kick in for some yeah, reason. Yeah, I know, I know. But it no, did. that was a spontaneous was, celebration was, of gratitude. The <laughs> <laughs> laundry situation was getting out of control. We've here. been way behind on laundry, and it's like there's a simple one single reason. It was like this is the oh, the so little simple. the little toothpick on the balance that overturned it. You know. <laughs> so like three weeks ago. I started taking one of the kids to, to physical therapy every week at the same time. Yeah, little Ellie Nelly. Yeah, so, yeah, take Eleanor to, to physical, see a physical yeah. therapist. And um, it's only an hour, right? Like an hour and a half total of my day, once a week. Including the driving. Yeah, including the driving. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. talking about an hour and a half. I mean, if you really want to pad it, say two hours, because I spend some time getting her ready before we go. But somehow that was the hour that where you either did the laundry, you got the initiative together <laughs> the, to do the, the laundry, laundry or something. But like once that was out of place, it all went to hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like no laundry happened. Yes. <laughs> Fortunately, we are, are uh, uh, what's the word, uh, hoarders? And we have clothes <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Well, I'm fortunate that that I um, work at a job where the business casual tilts more towards the, the casual. casual. So I'm literally picking up like a shirt off a pile on the floor, and I'm like, sniff test. <laughs> yeah, ah, I can I can, I can wear it one uh, more time. Yeah, that's good. It's good to go. So no, that that's it's also that's not real. summer that helps. Too. Yeah, it helps a lot too. Yeah, yeah. My goodness. Yeah, uh, you know, good coat covers up a lot of sins. Yeah, it really yeah. does. But yeah, now that's uh, so that's how it is that you're actually. There's a real balance to things and a rhythm to things, and you add to the rhythm. I just lose the beat right, immediately. Right. Just like right. A, what? What? Not, what now? I don't know how. Yeah, yeah. So this is a complicated weekend. Also, I feel really rushed and stressed. So I'm. I've been looking forward actually all all weekend to this time Yay. with you. Our date night. Our date night together. But um, on Saturday, I had to go into work because we're kind of yeah. in a crunch at work. Yeah. There's a trade show next week, and we're preparing all these boxes to ship out to the trade show. Mm. And they didn't all work, but we came really close to having all these new prototypes all ding, ready ding, for ding. display. It's kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. A lot of work. And then, um, so I was gone for most of the day yesterday, and then that, right. and then, um, so we didn't get to do any work on the podcast yesterday. yesterday. But uh, I did take the kids out to see a movie, which I felt was. A priority, but then we had to de uh, for budgetary reasons. We had to delete our our meal out, which meant you had to make another meal at home. Yeah. So we've been having a meal out after mass on Sunday, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. Instead, we saw a movie, and then it gets complicated. So yeah. But you made a, you made a wonderful dinner. We're just eating it. Chicken paprikash. The kids. The we we gave the kids a Doctor Who DVD and said, "Don't bug us." Don't bug us. You got Doctor Who. Yeah. What with the internet and all? <laughs> <laughs> Kids practically raise, raise themselves. themselves. No, they don't have they don't have the unrestricted internet, but they do have Doctor Who. Yeah. Ad liberandum. Pretty much. Anyway, so I did go out today. I took two of the kids to uh, an event hosted by the Huron Valley DSA. Mm-hmm. Um, Socialism 101. 101. 
So DSA is Democratic Socialists of America. Entry-level socialism. Yeah. So it was the first time they've offered this program, and it was like, uh, you know, put your chairs in a circle and introduce yourself and tell us your preferred pronouns. <laughs> and then uh, we talked about, uh, you know, what are the basics of, uh, of capitalism? How does capitalism work? How does socialism work? What, does, what are the tenets of the DSA and yeah. all that? Uh, the best part of it was a, a brief bit uh, where there was a, a young woman there who um, d- gave a very cogent explanation of uh, basically neoliberalism. Mm-hmm. And I want to see if I can get her as a guest on the show to talk through those points. Those points. Yeah. She, maybe not surprisingly, was all, oh, I'm not really an expert. You <laughs> well, know. I don't really know anything. But of course she does. You yeah. know, it's just that she, this is not her area of academic expertise or right. whatnot. You know, maybe she's just a linguist. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> Something. Anyway, so if not her, um, I'm recruiting people. If not her, you. Yes, you listener. <laughs> if not her, you. You need to step up. <laughs> Actually, now, no, we we are looking for millennials to to come on the podcast. We are looking for millennials. We started this project where we'd really like to talk as a theme this year about millennial economic issues. Yeah, and um, we finally got sort of our tech working Yay. last week. We hosted our friend Julie via uh, Google Chat, mm-hmm. and I think we can also make Skype work reasonably well. Although Google Chat seems to have better um, sound quality. Well, they're listening, so you know they want to be. They want to hear everything you clearly. say, so they can feed it directly to the NSA, and they don't have to strain to understand exactly, your, your yeah. sedition. Yeah, when they introduce it, because well, no, maybe they won't even use courts by that time. But but at least when they have it in court, you want to be sure that people can understand what's being said. They need to go. Uh, they, need, they need to know exactly where to send the drones. Oh, that yes, the true. Google drones. Google drones. <laughs> Did you hear about that? Oh no, no, this isn't a joke. No, oh. no, no. Sorry. It's never a you know joke what? anymore. We'll, we'll have to cover it's like the, the onion's going out of business because they can't the, make it up fast the onion enough. Onion can't make up jokes fast enough. No, we'll have to. I'll have to uh, get a topic together for a future week. But um, Google drones. Looking forward Google's to it. Google's apparently contributing, you know, like AI to uh, to drone. Anyway, it's. I got nothing. I'm sorry. It's, their their in their corporate slogan was "Don't be evil," and I'm like, well, guys, you know, I can't quite say this you know like just, just putting that out there yeah anyway so scumbags uh, we've got a lot to talk about i've got a there's always a lot to talk about <laughs> we never a, had enough time to prepare and and but we're here we're here anyway with boots on because it's Ta-da! cold down here uh i have a little story about energy bills i want to talk about oh yeah tell the energy so story. i turned this into a thing on twitter um, when we moved into a new house in February 2017, we signed up for the energy budget plan, which was to smooth out our DTE energy monthly payments and avoid having to pay like huge bills in winter. Mm-hmm. Uh, the budget plan that we set up last February uh, was based on the previous year's expenses. Uh, the previous year, though, the owner had not even lived in the house for most of the yeah, year. Yeah. So the heat was set very low. So based on that you know they came up with a number that was lower than and i expected it to be right. lower than we actually it would, would use right. you know having a whole family running the hot water heater and whatnot mm-hmm. um so when the settle up bill arrives which it does in um, all in good time the settle up always comes <laughs> It's true. It, I think oh, the bill yeah. shows up in February and it's due in March. Um, we had an option of paying a lump sum of $558.78 by March 14th to settle up. Or an option to, to spread the balance over the next 12 months. Hmm. So okay. option one would result in a new monthly budget plan number. <laughs> uh that would go from 182 over the last year to 210 a month. Mm-hmm. Option two would raise it to 256 dollars. Hmm. Um, by default, if you do nothing, they enroll you in option two. Right. So here's what that actually means, because I did the math. Oh, I like it when you do the math. <laughs> yeah. So if you look at the actual numbers. Uh, you subtract the budget plan amount from the lump sum. Yep. This suggests we actually exceeded the total budget plan charges for last year 
by three seventy six seventy eight. Yep. The option that they wanted to like just default you into, spread the balance over twelve months, would avoid us having to pay a big lump sum, which is always nice. But it would result in paying an extra five hundred and fifty two dollars over the next twelve months. What? Um that's spreading uh so five fifty two. That looks to me like it, it would involve paying $175.22 in interest for that loan of $376.78, which makes an effective interest rate of something like 46.5%. Which is... Usury. Usury. <laughs> I had some other words that I decided not to use. <laughs> and this is what they will default to doing. So by default, it's 46% they sign interest. You up. By default, they roll over your balance into a new payday loan. Wasn't that nice? Is that even? This is the thing. Is this legal? I'm assuming it's legal. Payday loans are legal. I get, yeah, like payday loans are legal. So you know. So, but you know, in in sane countries, uh, an APR like that is absolutely illegal. It's, like, it's criminal. It's yeah. Criminal. Um, and that's the default. So. They also, they make it more difficult to choose option one. So if yeah. you click on the button that says... Pay the lump sum. You go to their website, and it takes you automatically to make a payment of your regular bill amount. Right. Right, which does not, would not... So you've clicked on the button that says, you pay know, your amount. Pay, pay now, mm-hmm. and it is immediately steering you back into the regular payment. Into, yeah, and, but which is effectively option two. Yeah. So, so they keep steering it to, ex- to option uh, uh, two. The whole while you're trying to get to option one, they're basically like, you know, just go back here and do option two. What do you mean? Yeah, option two? Yeah. What do you mean? And so you look at your balance and you try to figure out how to pay now. But because this lump sum isn't, which is better for you to play, pay the lump sum, yeah. because that's not on your bill, you don't have an option on the website to pay it. So oh. I try to sign into the chat. Like I want to tell a rep that I want to pay. I want to do the thing. Right, there's an online chat. Yep. Oh, look, online chat's down. <laughs> oh, down for that's maintenance. weird. Look at that. That's really weird. Yeah, so I had a call, which, and then you have to wait on hold for, yeah. you know, 20 minutes. Right, right. Because, um, you know, that's fun. Anyway, so I am fortunate because I happen to have enough money, having, you know, just received a tax refund and having a, a pretty relatively high income that I could afford to play the lump sum. Mm-hmm. That's the better option as far as not blowing money. Not getting money, the shaft. Not, not getting, getting the, the shaft. shaft. Just paying for what you what you used, right? Yeah, I'm just okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, but um, a lot of people who are most in need of not getting the shaft, yeah, may not have that option. No, they need to do it. You know, over time, they need to minimize their bill as much as possible. Right. Which is not really minimizing their total bill no it's just as possible. it's insulating them from um large bills in the winter time yeah yeah and this now mind you all right this, this is this is just a little background this was actually the result of um legal action taken for shutting people off of in the winter to and, avoid shutoffs to avoid shutoffs and um well and and there is law in michigan that Legally, between November 15th and March 15th, you can't turn the heat off if there's an elderly person in the home or a child in the home. Mm-hmm. You cannot, they, you're not allowed to turn off the heat. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. in many places, it's the heat and electric are bundled. So right. the electricity and the heat has to stay on through the winter months, period. <laughs> well, some people use heater, electric heaters. So, right, you know. right. And now, mind you, we don't have that kind of protection for the summertime. Right. Um, which is equally important You'll, and if your uh, electricity is shut off well in our case we don't have a well pump then then we don't have a well pump we don't have yeah. water yeah so it's a situation you know, we, that's a situation that can quickly escalate into you losing your kids with child oh, protective yeah. services because they can't live it's somewhere where you control. don't have power and water yeah so um well and also in the summertime um air conditioning is an issue for some people who have delicate health conditions yes. and for some people who use uh medical equipment absolutely it's actually like a situation your, your you're morphine pump or whatever whatever it is you've got um yeah. you need year round so those protections are in place but we do have legal protection we do have legal protection for children and elderly people through the winter months yeah yeah um 
further legal action was taken to, I think it was a class action suit against Energy Interest in Michigan, that they have to offer this budget plan. Mm-hmm. So because the people will get these shutoffs right. because their bill would pile up during the winter. There's no way they could pay right. them. Yeah. And then they'd have a huge bill at the end of March and they'd lose power in, in April. The yeah. power would be shut off. Yeah. Well, the situation in Saginaw was very strange. I tried in two different years to sign up for the budget plan. Oh, yeah. But if you don't sign up within like the two week window where you're allowed to sign up or so you, you turn it on, it gives you really bizarre results. Yeah, like like, like it says, that'll be two thousand dollars a month. Okay, yeah, your your new plan amount is a thousand dollars a month or something. Like what? I just, it just went from the last bill was was four hundred and now it's a thousand. What? It doesn't make any sense. But our bills in in Saginaw because it was a big old house and very drafty. Yeah. They varied from you know a hundred and something to seven hundred and something. Oh no! It, it was like in the height. It was almost nine hundred dollars. Was it? Was one that January? Our, was that our highest? That our highest was almost nine hundred dollars. Jesus! Wow. Right. So you block these things out, right? Yeah. Well, no, and that actually wasn't. Um, an outrageous Saginaw bill. Lots of people had those bills. Yeah. So this, the idea yeah. is and for we, people who were that was really, for, to keep our our thermostat set at sixty three. By the way, yes, we which meant like, that in a know, lot of rooms it was actually in the fifties. The fifties, yeah. yeah. In most rooms, that's right. Yeah. So in, yeah, a lot of money for a lot of energy to stay barely warm. Right, and uh, not not and having lost jobs, not really able to afford to do. a a big insulation and weather ceiling. Oh, a big weather thing. You yeah. Know, process. Which, you know, would have been nice. Yeah. And you know, it was always a good idea. I don't discourage anyone from doing it. No. no. But the, this larger issue of people who are far more marginalized than we've ever been. Right. Um, never being able to, to get the heat on or the electric on anywhere they live. Right. And the budget plans that DTE and Consumers Energy are required to offer by law now mm-hmm. are to allow people to make a stable payment for their energy yeah. each month and you know, budget for it. What's what's called the budget right. plan, so right. you can actually fit it into your budget, and you don't have these huge, huge jumps. unexpected jumps yeah. that you can't anticipate or manage. Now, mind you, their SOP, it appears, is to use it as just another income stream. Yeah. So I, actually, I need to look really closely at, at what it means to sign up for the budget plan to begin with. Yeah. In other words, so th- the way it works, though, is you just say, I just want to go on the budget plan, and they just give you a number. Yeah, here's a number. And they, I found out, too, they they gave you a number for the year, mm-hmm. although they didn't normally adjust that number. Um Last year, uh, you know, during the the year, like they adjusted during the settle up period, mm-hmm. right? Well, last year with Consumers Energy and Sagna, they just jacked it up by a hundred bucks one month. Like, ah, uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna need more. And if I, when I looked at the actual like expenditures, expenditures and whatnot, it didn't look like we were really, ex, you know, out of line. They right. said, oh, um, you know, they're predicting. Yeah, you're gonna spend a lot bad of bad weather, aren't you? <laughs> it was like they told me it had something to do with the weather prediction. Like, really? come on. So you heard a weather prediction, now you went under the 100 bucks? <sighs> really? That's how it works? Okay. And then, I mean, it was so far off that when they the settle up in um, Saginaw last, you know, last year was, I got back, like, we had an overage of over $1,000, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. So... We paid them $1,000. Right. So that's money they got to invest or whatever, you exactly. know. Exactly. So, uh, so really, DTE... Yeah, right get you coming and going with this little scam right. which is supposed to be allowing poor people to keep the power on yeah but i mean to be fair here for D- dte over the past year we did use more than we paid oh, for. yeah we certainly use more than we paid for but what i want to know is when you sign up on this normal budget plan they just give you a number how much of that number is like financing interest in advance or you something. know is like their estimated interest or their um, administrative fees or whatever, whatever, that if you just paid the number that was due each month, you w- would, would not pay. pay. Right, right. How yeah. much of that gets gets incorporated when you just turn on the budget plan? They make that very difficult to, to find, find right. on your bill. It's really not that clear. Um, yeah. Because Which means when, they're probably stealing. When they set up the budget plan, they just give you a number. And then if you want to see if you're over or under or whatnot, you've got to do all the math yourself. 
Well, yeah, because so, we're all looking for a little homework, you know? Yeah, there's all this stuff you can click on on the DTE site that shows you charts and graphs of energy expenditures and temperature out and, Bold, you know, whatnot. New, but effective. none of it is like... Transparent. Your actual... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Paid, you know, paid versus spent, you know, like right. how much money are we actually basically stealing from you? Well, they don't want to like be upfront about it. That would be like weird <laughs> that, and that wrong. That would be weird and wrong. <laughs> anyway, this is just a reminder that it's really easy to get defaulted into something that is really bad for you. Defaulted into a ripoff by people that ostensibly you should be able to trust. Yeah. And this happens all the time. And... You know, DTE, Consumers Energy, all these folks, they are not your friends and you need to watch your bills like a hawk. Well, no, and I think this is something that, uh, like a little uh, sort of structural thing that people may not be yeah. really thinking about or aware yeah. of. I'm sure we all know, but you may not think about it. Right. No, they have a monopoly. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they do. In they a have a monopoly. Region, effectively, yeah. There's nowhere else to buy your gas right. and electric. Sometimes from. there's an alternative provider that uses their infrastructure. You know, yeah, like but you pay you, more but for. Do you still have but to usually you pay more, the, right? Well, you pay more. You pay more for people's energy, which comes from solar or something, but right. it's delivered on your same infrastructure. Right. right. It's very it, confusing. It's not confusing. It's not confusing at all. <laughs> they have a monopoly, yes. and since they have a monopoly, they say, "Here's a choice that costs you more." What do you think? Right. Because they have a monopoly. They can make that choice right. useless. It completely useless. And yeah. this is what's really critical about them having a monopoly. Mm-hmm. Um, our government gave it to them. Yes, which so, means we gave it to them. Which means we gave it to them. Right. And um, I think this is part of the reason and one of the reasons and part of the, the, um, the source for why I just you know, don't believe in the state. <laughs> okay. at the end of the day but you know okay anyway so that's about electricity closely watch your energy bills you can easily yeah. wind up getting screwed by because you can't trust them energy companies you can't trust them and dte you suck seriously this is what i sent to them on twitter they never responded but, um, no it's best to be quiet about it anyway okay <coughs> So reading and digress. W- <laughs> do we ever <laughs> do we ever reading and watching? Oh yeah, what are we reading and watching? I'm I'm not really reading anything right now. I you know. I have a few things to mention, uh, kind of um, briefly, but then I have a long review. Yeah, briefly. I, I'm yes. A okay. few things to mention now briefly before our main topics. Okay. Then after our main topics, I have a long uh, review of A Wrinkle in Time, which oh. is the movie that uh, I, I took the kids to see Yeah, last night. It was good. Was it really last night? It was, really, it was last night. It's it was been, like days ago. Yeah, no, we've been doing a lot. We've been doing a lot. So, um, so the, reading watching. We did, um, we watched a Doctor Who serial called The Web of Fear from 1968. Mm-hmm. So, I'm... Um, Short review. This is a, a base defense story. Do you know what that means? No. no. It's it's a common trope in science fiction, fantasy, basically. Oh, oh the one with the, the Yeti? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no, what you mean. Yep. Where, where everyone's sort of locked into a base right. or an outpost or a garrison of some kind. And, it's been and they're being invaded or, invaded or, or attacked. Or they're under siege. Right. It's a very common way to tell a story without having to use too many sets. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's why we have one set, one right. under siege in the set. So. Right. Uh, it leave. could also be, um, it's related to something called a bottle episode. Yeah. Which is where you stick all the characters like they're trapped in an elevator or elevator. something like that. Yeah. Cuts, on, cuts it on set costs. It cuts down And on, like your scary scary creature, you don't even have to see it. They just have to be banging the outside of the elevator. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's really scary. One of one of the best Doctor Who, the new best new Doctor Who episodes ever made was a a bottle episode and a siege story. <gasps> oh yeah. Called I think it was Midnight. Yeah, were they in that like that gondola or something? They're, they're in like a a bus yeah. that's traveling across the surface of this planet, and the um, sun on this planet is so bright 
that the bus is effectively sealed up. Yes. No one can, they can only look outside using instruments. Mm -hmm. They can't go outside. They'd be like vaporized. vaporized. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, and all, everything creepy happens while they're all contained in this, this bus, bus and they start to turn on each other. And it, it, yeah. It's one of one of my favorite episodes. It's a David, oh, that was David Tennant. David it? Tennant yeah. episode. Yeah. Oh, that was during uh, Do the Donald Noble stretch? Uh, no, because I think Donald Noble... She was... Oh, yeah, so... Yeah, but she wasn't there. She wasn't there. She, she was, like, was on vacation on that day. The, at the resort. <laughs> right. Right. And he's taking this trip to go see something on this something, bus. right. I think he's going to see like a giant diamond waterfall or somewhere, some yeah, thing some they never thing. show. There's lots right. of things like they're, that. Because they're on the bus. Right. Um, and then uh, there's one strange moment where briefly you see on like the video screens uh, on the bus, just sort of in the background, you see Rose appear. Mm -hmm. But that's this thing that's happening where Rose is starting to break through into his reality. So, hey, we need you. Yeah. Like, dude, dude, don't help. <laughs> Our ratings are declining. <laughs> bring something. Rose back. Yeah, so they bring... Anyway. So it's a base defense story. Um, it's kind of a more conventional monster story, even though the monsters are actually giant robotic yetis. <laughs> Not rugs. They look like rugs. They look okay, like walking right. carpets. Yeah, big walking shack Or carpets. giant cookie monsters, as one reviewer commented. <laughs> the cookie monster actually like had, had a haircut. So this has a few interesting moments. Um, I really like the visual style, and it's neat that they're like in the subway system. Yeah. Because it's very noirish. You yeah. have lots of half-lit scenes where pe you know frightened people huddling, and they're lit from... An, an extreme side. angle or right. whatnot so it looks a lot like some of my favorite noir films and i really love some some of these uh, noir crime dramas from the 50s like he 40s. walked by night yeah. 40s yeah, yeah. sorry smoke and he mirrors. walked by night yeah um but mostly it's only of interest for the people who want to study the history of the show right you know so this is the first um serial where we see Lethbridge Stewart. Yeah. He's a colonel. This was before he became brigadier general. But his actual introduction footage... Yeah, I don't say anything about him. ...is especially. lost because episode three is still missing. So oh. he show, shows up. So they did a DVD release where they um, reconstructed episode three, but they didn't make it animated. Yeah. Which is a shame because some of the animations are pretty, pretty cool. Good. Yeah. Uh, they just made it... Uh, snapshots with audio which they do sometimes yeah um but the fan edit for the fan edit the fan editor just took that out just, took that out just removed it. everything from episode three um mm -hmm. so the but the net effect is that about halfway through the edit lethbridge stewart, stewart just appears. appears and he's just in, he starts to be in scenes and there's no explanation of who he is he's and i don't here. think you even right. ever hear his name right, right. no no but um, so that actor is Nicholas Courtney. He's very charismatic, really charismatic. Yeah. He's always fun to watch when he's on screen, mm -hmm. and he, he for, for decades, <laughs> literally for decades. Yeah. yeah, he had like a forty-year career with Doctor Who, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, that's fun, and he leads. There's like a battle sequence in London where yes, that's kind of creepy. Where, where of, the yeah. walking carpets are walking, sort of in synchronized. Ching. In slow motion, yeah, they all move so slowly, and you're like, "Why, Why don't you just scared? walk away? Walk away! You <laughs> just could, go over there. You you could go get a smoke and a coffee, and it would take them a half hour to come get you. <laughs> or you could get in your jeep and drive it and 15 drive. miles an hour, and you know, they'd be them hours entirely. away. <laughs> Evade them entirely, but no, no, no. Anyway, you've got to scream and run through the corridor and stop. Yeah, trip so, over your own shoelace. So yeah, Nicholas. So um. Uh, Lethbridge Stewart leads a fight up on the surface yeah. against these things that have apparently taken over London, and mm -hmm. um, and like everyone's killed, but him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that, they're far more vicious than we ever imagined. Ever imagined what with their uh, giant hairiness and their glue guns, you know, like <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Anyway, so this is not uh, this is not the best not a cereal. Winner. It's overly long. I can't long. recommend it. It's overly complicated. The ending is like a muddled mess where like the writers just throw up their hands. And, like, Said, okay, I guess it's over. Just now. improvise the ending. Whatever yeah. you know. There's a lot of there's a lot Close of shouting at the end. Shout. Like, everyone's standing around. And there's so there are way too many objects in this one, like all these little devices and things they're fooling with. They and don't it's make like, any sense. It's just more, more characters, more monsters, more things than are are really necessary at all for the plot. Well, anyway. I feel like Doctor Who does a lot of this sort of um, uh, make something up to fill in the plot hole. Yeah, so I've I've got that's, that's a, I, at this point it's tradition. It's re- it really is a, a tradition, honestly. Um, yeah, one of the, the things one of the things they tend to do, the although flat. it doesn't happen in this episode so much, is but especially in a lot of the old ones, is they have what the fans refer to as a catch and release cycle, mm-hmm. where like, oh, the companion escaped, oh, she's caught and returned back, and now we're starting back in square one. one. Oh, the doctor escapes. Okay. Oh, they returned they him, and now he's back in square, square one. one. And in a typical episode of Old Doctor Who, this might happen two or three, three times. times in an episode. Yeah, and, well, or in a serial, you know, in a well, story. Well, I always I felt like it would happen two or three times in Sometimes an episode. Sometimes in an episode, and then like the next episode, it happens again. I'm oh. like, seriously? It's one What's of what's happening. It's in the story? one of the ways that they pad the story. Right, catch and release. Uh, yeah, literally this catch release cycle, mm-hmm. and it's it's painfully boring to watch, if, especially if you watch the episodes back to back. Oh. Anyway, so yeah, we watched that. Um, I finished a a book. Yeah, what book? This was the second novel in the uh, Once and Future King mm-hmm. uh, omnibus edition. So it's not even really a book. It's not a standalone book, but it's oh, a. Right. It is a. It is a book inside the novel. It's like the way. It's sort of the similar to the way that. Um, Lord of the Rings is actually broken into six books and three volumes, usually. Right, right. I mm-hmm. have seen it published as six volumes occasionally. There have been some editions. Right. Like, uh, there's, you know, uh, so like... So the like us- Fellowship would be two is books. two books. Right. Book one, book two, yeah. And then, you know, the, right. the Two Towers, book one, yeah. book two. So it, the King, book one, Lord one, of two. the Rings is one massive novel. One long novel. In, six books. In six books, usually mm-hmm. published in three volumes, but there are one volume editions and there are six volume editions. Yes. So, um, th- so uh, the the book within the Once and Future King arc is the Queen of Air and Darkness, mm. and it's about um, the is it Morgaus or Morgaine? I can never remember Morgaine. which is which. Is it Morgaine? I think it's Morgaine. Okay. It's the um, the Queen of Air and Darkness is uh, Arthur's half sister, right? And he doesn't know that this is his half sister because he never learned who his mother is. Oh! But uh, mm-hmm. she has a number of children. Among the children are Gawain, mm-hmm. and uh, so this story kind of sets up. A number of events leading up to the semi incestuous relationship. Uh, well, it's fully incestuous, it's I fully guess. Incestuous, yeah, yeah. But between Arthur and his half sister, mm-hmm. which he doesn't know is his half sister, right? And that um, that uh, unfortunate doomed um, doomed romance, yeah, <laughs> leads to the birth of Mordred. Mm-hmm. which is Arthur's nemesis ultimately. Yeah. So this is his, you know, the, the, the uh, once and future King is the story of the fall. It's like Mort to Arthur's story of Arthur's fall really. Mm-hmm. And his fall happens in the traditional storytelling because of this sin, this, right. even though he didn't know who he was sleeping with, you know, See, you're always supposed to know. <laughs> you, should you should always, always find know. out who you're sleeping with. I'm just What's saying. your name? Who's your daddy? <laughs> Does is he look? Is he rich, rich like, like me? me? <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah. So there's that. Yeah. Um, so that's a complicated thing that that happens, but it also is leavened by um, Palinor and the antics where uh, I see. I'm missing some of my notes, but Palinor and um, the other guy. The other guy. You know who the other guy is. 
they dress up in a questing beast costume. Hard. And <laughs> or, or Pelinor is, is pining away, and his two buddies dress up in a questing beast costume to try and entice him into chasing the questing beast again, because that's what he does. Come on, chase the and, questing beast. You know, come on, it's fun. <laughs> reading as an, as an adult, they're talking about two guys in what is this? It's essentially like the horse costume, horse costume. gag. One gets to be the front, and one gets it's to be the horse's the ass, right? So, So, you know... You know where that's going to go. And, and T.H. White was a... Was a grown man. He was a grown man, but it, he was a sadomasochist, and he was a gay man. And this is according to rumor, you know, that the stories about his life and whatnot. Oh, right. But right. that, you know, so he was... Um, some of that showed up in his writing. Some of that showed up in his writing, and some of it is in, in the interactions inside the uh, suit there are a lot of really broad jokes about spanking about oh, you know like prancing winking <laughs> you know winking i'm winking my eye well i'm prancing I'm as hard prancing. as i can talks about well i can't when i'm winking my eye i can't see the anal appendage of <laughs> anyway it's it's yeah it's just really naughty and but funny naughty and funny yeah. and so that leavens it a little bit right well, and, and it sounds like a lot of these jokes would really be completely missed by a 12-year-old. Well, they were. I didn't really get, you didn't get, them until, get yeah. that this was like... Oh, a, you were a pretty dirty 12-year-old. Well, yeah. But anyway, I didn't, I didn't get the context well, dirty-minded of, anyway. Of, <laughs> I didn't... I didn't the yeah. con, Some of that context of, of T.H. White's actual like life story, I did, did not get. You were completely unaware. Right? Yeah. Anyway, so I, I'm just proud that I finished a book, even though this is a very short novel inside the context of this. Um, larger uh, novel. Sorry. Con- short book inside the context Sh- of a larger uh, novel. Yes. That. But it's progress. It's progress. Because this year I have like finished like two books, and it's Moving March. Moving forward. It's March. I know. I, uh, yeah. Last, yeah. like in 2016, I read 54 books. You know, you know this, is, this is where I was like... I want to say 22 years ago, Ugh. I was trying to like do quilting and all these things that I, you know, I have had to move on. You know? Well, I mean, I, I tell myself, you know, I've made a, I'm, I'm starting to move away from someone who spends all his time reading to someone who spends much more time writing, writing. and producing material. Well, that's, that's probably good. And that's a good thing, but there's so much that I'd like to read for research, you know, and yeah, for this, yeah. especially the to, nonfiction. To catch you up, right. Anyway. What is it? You know, so um, apparently Oprah reads a book a night, at least she did last time I heard her talk about oh, it. Oh, really? Yeah, just some deep absurdity. Like, seriously, you read a book a night? I, how? No, no, how? I, I don't think, uh, when is people, she lying? When people claim lying. that, I think they skim highlight and flip or she has a staff member who like highlights sections or something and previews it or whatnot you know i I can't imagine yeah i can't i i used to read a book a night when i was a child you know yeah and i I, stayed up half the night i've only ever read two books like that there i've read books like that as a kid definitely but it's even as a child but it's way too hard on my eyes now for one thing well and i I just the, can't put everything else aside like that. Well, yeah, and that's the other problem, of course. But yeah. I just can't actually sit and read for longer than about 30 minutes before mm-hmm. my eyes are telling me no. No, and then, none of that. And then if I do that, if I read way too long and then I like jump in the car and start to drive, I can't see <laughs> so can't anything. See. My eyes muscles are all pulled out of shape and they don't, it takes forever to like accommodate again. Right. To Anyway. To all that so stuff. we're going to come back after the main topics, like I said, to talk about a wrinkle in time. Um, but, uh, but no, we've got a couple of topics here, right? Maybe we have, yeah. So we also have uh, listener feedback. Oh, that's right. We have list- so we have our listener, uh, Leela, and who- <laughs> I shouldn't say singular. Oh, well, we have lots of listeners. Well, Leela comments. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. So, our friend Ken comments sometimes too. Okay. Oh, that's true. Ken comments. Leela comments. Adam hasn't commented in a long time. I don't think we made this, them short enough. He wanted us to to chop them up into shorter, shorter pieces. Chunks. Like, well, that's like what the pause button is for. Dude. I, I, I'm not going to upload a dozen files. A dozen files? Uh, <laughs> that wouldn't be more fun? <laughs> I have 
I have enough to do to produce what we've got. It's so time consuming. But. So, um, Leela responded uh, to like two episodes ago to um, uh, the episode where we talked about uh, Jai McMath about yes. uh, uh, like organ donation and what it means to die. Yeah, and she said also, I think the last thing you said. Maybe I'm reading out of order. Yeah. The the last thing you said about rethinking your position on the subject of organ donation is wise. That was just a brief comment I made at the end is like a story like this, you know, really does make me kind of rethink this like standard thing you're supposed to do, which is just sign your organ, sign your driver's license. Right. And um, to agree to donate any organs at mm -hmm. all that they can use in the event of some kind of traumatic brain injury yeah um so there is so much disinformation greed overwhelming distraction in our current reality mostly by design i have been processing a lot of grief about this for the past few years and continue to work on ways to lessen my dependency on the system and i just want to really thank leela for bringing that up that we're dependent yeah. on a system yeah. yeah and to the extent that you can lessen your dependency on the system right um you're doing good right and in america at present the medical system, all aspects of it, are for profit. For profit, broken, and really. And, and so they really ha act, there's an incentive for them to declare you dead and take your organs. Yeah. A, a financial incentive. A financial incentive. Well, and there, there, there's so many perverse financial incentives. Like the incentive the hospital has to declare her dead to reduce their liability. Yeah. And yeah. that, ironically, in Michigan is literally reverse. <laughs> that if you survive your hospital encounter, you will have a lower, um, you you can make, your ability to sue is lower. Mm -hmm. you, the hospital has lower liability if you survive the encounter. Well, that's or, what happened to you. You survived. So, so like, the, yeah, something the, to sue about. The attorneys you spoke to said, well, you're not disabled now. You're disabled and you're not, you're alive. Right. It, so, it, nothing to sue over. There's nothing to sue over. And, uh, it's which. almost, and actually our motivation for suing yeah, we didn't want any money, actually. We didn't actually want money, or maybe we'll take a dollar, right? But right. we want an apology, and we want you guys to change your your procedures. Your, right, so your... you don't kill people by accident. Yeah. It's one of these things. But apparently, uh, the disincentive to kill patients is is, is legally in place, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a state-by-state -state thing. Your state right. may be different. Well, I, don't, right. I don't know. Um, and what? they also talked about this in the article, about how they had a kind of a fear that this case and this conversation would lead people to be less trustful of organ donation. Yeah, and they they weren't happy about that. Right. And I don't I don't know. I, I think if organ donation as a thing doesn't stand on its own two feet without us doing ethical uh, gymnastics. Right. Right. Then I you know. I don't, you got you got to wonder if I, that's really the best way to save people. Is this really what we need to be doing? You know, I, yeah. I don't know. How uh, was that? Oh, go ahead. Over time, I think technologically there will be fixes. We'll have, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get past grow it. We'll organs else. out of stem cells. Or, well, I think know. technologically we'll get lots of places where maybe open heart surgery won't be a thing we do anymore. A lot of things that we do, and we're like, right, well, that's right. That that you know, seems reasonable. Are yeah barbaric oh that's all that's like the star trek vision where mccoy is like they used to cut and sew people like garments you know it was yeah. barbaric the monsters yeah. you know like well that was what they knew how to do that's and it, it saved do. people and it saved people so you know but from and, his lofty perspective in what 22 something or his ref and not even lofty but just reflective right he's like that was just that barbaric. was awful all the pain the blood you know it's like here, here in our in our uh, world, reality, we just wave a vibrating salt shaker over the person. We wave and, wands, and they're fixed. <laughs> press right. buttons, right? Yeah. Non invasive, non invasive. So it's uh, we we do and we do make these sort of ethical um, jumps that we have to make yeah, yeah. to do things that are really traumatic. In the service of saving people. Well, we did it with our own daughter. We handed yeah. handed her over to be cut and sewed like a garment, you know, yeah. to be sliced open like a watermelon and have her heart stopped and, you know. And have a machine breathe for her for hours? Uh, yeah. So, and pump her blood. And because we believe that was the long term, that if we didn't intervene in this way, that she would gradually get sick and die from her heart. Heart conditions. Condition. 
So I I understand um, maybe making an ethical stretch. Yep. Because that baby looked healthy to me. I didn't she, see anything she, wrong with her. I think she seemed sluggish, you uh, know, oh. and her circulation seemed a little poor at times. At times. Well, and did so, you did you see that? Did yeah, you, yeah. You, you felt you felt that. Okay, where well, I didn't cold, actually cold hands and mottled hands and feet. Right. You know, and she just seemed to rest more than than I sleepy. expected. A sleepy little baby. Yeah. yeah, and since then, she now she she actually her energy level it did increase quite a bit after yeah. her, after I mean after she healed up right. Right. After she healed, well, she had a sort of a low ebb after. Right. Right. After. right. But and she's you know quite energetic. She seems very much a healthy child now. Yeah. Yeah. So that so we believe it was the right decision. Well, it, yes, and I, I'm not. I don't mean to suggest that. Um, right. It was the right decision. I feel that it was. I'm no. confident that it was. Yeah. But I'm also keenly aware that there was an ethical stretch that I had to make to intervene on an otherwise healthy, ch- apparently healthy child. Apparently healthy. And, but you know. But if you did look at the ultrasound, like her condition was not subtle. Right. Right. And yeah. but you know. But I've got to trust. Right, the physicians that the, that and the, trust the machine. That the machine is, and your it's, reading of the of it is exactly. That's really not how a heart is supposed to look. That's bad. Exactly. Yeah. I've got to have that trust, and if that trust isn't present, I can't make the ethical stretch. Yeah, and events like this whole situation with this poor girl, they undermine that. They undermine trust. trust. Yeah, and that's a really, that's really the grease that allows medicine to function at all mm-hmm. is trust yeah. because a lot of times you're in okay so if I'm like I have a broken bone and I need it set it's pretty clear what mm-hmm. what the relationship is and what needs to happen but if I you know feel pretty good and I'm just getting a checkup and you suggest some radical intervention because <laughs> I don't know you saw something right I need to trust that you actually saw something and yeah. that what do you understand and what you're telling me isn't just some tale. Yeah. It means that actually when a doctor, usually when a doctor tells me, oh, this is nothing, um, I'm inclined to believe the doctor because I believe they're actually going against their incentives. Right. 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 So and They're going against their incentives. And you know, I was only here to hear that. I came here to get mm-hmm. confirmation that this is nothing. Yeah, and I, I hope that that's true, and right. not just oh, this doctor is actually pretty incompetent that and doesn't didn't know what notice this severe this severe problem, this important symptom. So, um, this whole trust thing, I think that's the reason um, you fear to say this, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're honest about what happens and the way organization works, and these kinds of cases. You increase trust, which increases the functionality of medicine in general. Yeah. Medicine works better for all of us if we are transparent and trustworthy in the work that we do. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe, maybe it will undermine organ donation. Maybe we should never have been doing it to begin with. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know for sure. I, mean, I, I hope I never have to find out if I, how I really feel because yeah. I need an organ or something. Right. Um, but I'm... I'm confident I would refuse an organ for myself. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any uh, any further comments? Oh, we need to tell Joshua how much she enjoyed hearing his voice. Yeah, because <laughs> that was last week. Joshua yeah. came on and read his book report. Oh yeah, that was sweet. Yeah, I'm really glad. I, I'm I'm really glad we could get him on here. We had to do a couple quick dry runs, um, mm-hmm. and then I realized after as I was listening back that because I was nervous for him that uh, while he was speaking, I was kind of leaning in to like ready to like help him with a word or something. (laughs) And I didn't do the thing I usually do, which is kind of turn my head away from the mic when I'm not. (sighs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So the net effect was all through Joshua's talk, little talk, I'm leaned in like this and I go, (sighs) (sighs) I'm like, mouth breathing it sounds terrible but oh, it's too late to fix it now too late too late yeah so I, i'm is. in the habit normally of turning of moving my head around a bit to help control my breath it's a thing you know like leaning on the mic and breathing into it is not not really good mic technique no it's it's like like poor radio etiquette or something yeah yeah i, I don't have very much etiquette it's a real it's it's a real um 
subject on the podcasting subreddit because people are like, I listen back to myself and I, I'm breathing constantly, you know, and it sounds breathing. weird. I'm like, well, it also sounds weird if you have someone you're interviewing and you like edit out every breath. Right. And, because people breathe and we, <laughs> we know that. And if you listen to that person being interviewed and the person never breathes, you will actually typically you it's will unconsciously ho start holding your breath oh that's weird along with the person who isn't actually holding their breath it's a little stressful to listen to someone who doesn't make breath noises because it even if you don't notice it consciously some part of your brain is like this person's holding his breath maybe i should too breath. are we underwater maybe we're underwater <laughs> It's almost like that. Yeah. And so well, like... No, I feel like it takes your brain into the uncanny Kenny Valley. Yeah. You're like, huh, yeah. there's no breathing here. I guess I'd better stop. So if you listen to something like, you know, like the gold standard is probably fresh air. Okay. Terry Gross, how she interviews people and, and yeah. what you hear in the edit with their breath. And they use these very expensive Neumann condenser microphones, you know. Yeah. Um, they do not remove all the breath sounds. No. They only tone them down or minimize them if someone's snorting, snorting, or <laughs> panting into the mic, or or doing or doing something like what I was doing. <laughs> right? Then they would probably, you and know, lower out. my lower the volume level of my track while Joshua was speaking, Speak just so it wasn't quite so loud. Noisy. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry, that, that was a, that was a real digression. Yeah, no, no, it happens. It happens. But yeah. um, thank you. For, we'll tell Josh how much you enjoyed it. I'm hoping we can get uh, Josh back with another book report. So I actually ordered the next book in the series for him. And he's going against my better judgment <laughs> because well, these kind of books awful. are pretty awful, They're honestly. Awful. Yeah. Oh my goodness! But now we. He's reading. I, I actually really don't. Complain. I actually don't censor the children's reading. No, of their own selection. No, not. They're welcome to select whatever they like. Even if they, they like want to, to try an adult book, I mean, you know, we don't have porn in the house, but, no, um, no, but if they wanted to read like one of our adult books, like Sam picked up this uh, book of uh, uh, that is a series of essays by all these psychologists and psychotherapists about the the uh, the psychopathologies of Donald Trump. Oh yeah, and he's yeah. been reading that. Reading that at breakfast. Like, you know, okay, right. you want to give a book report when you're done? <laughs> We'd love to hear it. Yeah, yeah. No, so no, I don't like to censor the children in their own <laughs> uh, reading selections. I do, however, um, I'm we like, pretty, I'm pretty we, careful about what I offer them. We like to steer them in the direction of literature that we believe is actually valuable to read. Yeah. And yeah. The, I, I'm not going to jump on the zombies books or the Captain Underpants books or the, you know. Oh, I will. Okay. It's trash. You, you, you don't like Captain Underpants, but you also didn't like the Wimpy Kid books. No, I didn't like the Wimpy Kid books. I, I actually loved those. I thought they were pretty oh. good. And honestly, at a certain age, anything that just really encourages the kids to read is, is mostly a good thing. I suppose so yeah well, but like I, I, i'm when we read things to them we read them classic yes. myths and stories that we appreciate for the story for the know? story yeah so there's there's what i give them as one thing and what they choose is another yeah and they're welcome to choose whatever they'd their like. tastes our kids tastes are all over the map honestly yeah they really are okay where are we now Main topics. Main topics. Boom. Here is we got the, right to it. Is that it. the last of the, the listener feedback? Yeah, that's the last of listener feedback. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And uh, main topics. Yeah. So um, I actually I actually have one main topic, right? And then I feel like it it kind of spins into other things. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we'll even touch on everything that this touches on. It's it's a it's really a big topic, All right. and we have. I'm going to put in the show notes links to two articles that sort of touch on this. Mm -hmm. And um, you may not you may not see them as actually connected initially, but I hope I can make the connection clear. Yeah. So you're gonna. So, so the, you're, the, this is. I'm mostly going to try and listen on this bit because I did not reread the articles in time oh, for the show. Oh. I was working on the review of a Wrinkle in Time. So. Yeah, you know, we do what you got to do. do so the first do. one is from uh, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which I, I need to confess, I don't actually read their site as often as I would like. Sometimes like, they have some good stuff. I've seen good they stuff They frequently on have before. some really good stuff. Um, they, they aren't, um, I, I wouldn't say their bias is not my bias, but... Um, it's 
it's often a pretty common liberal or neoliberal bias. Yes, but this, many, many times. this piece is is less so. This piece is less so. It's more well. It's referring to someone else's research, right? So. And it's a, it's a little more incisive, but largely fairness and accuracy in reporting are fair. Um, mm-hmm. It's an interesting source of information. It's a good thing to read. Yeah. I, and mind you, I, there are lots of things that I read that I don't share their bias. And in fact, I'm antagonistic to their You're bias. You're trying to get out of your bubble. But I'm, try, I'm yeah. making an effort to read widely and gather more information. Because if I know their bias and I read what they say, that's two pieces of information that kind of lets me triangulate mm-hmm. um, meaning. And figure out what you want to take out of it. And figure out what I want to take that's out of it. And figure valuable. out what it means and what's valuable here. Yeah. And, I, and I think... Um, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to read this and we'll get to this, but I want to just put this out there to start with. Um, check out FAIR. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, they're worth reading. And we'll this whole... Link. We'll have a link to, we'll have a link to them. This whole thing about, um, oh, people are in their bubbles and it's destroying everything because, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 fake news and we've got to regulate the news and shut this down and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. Um, that's just a bullshit red herring. Okay? That it is, often, when you're making that argument, it often is. Yeah. I do believe people live in news bubbles, but... but that, well, no, and that's that's this thing that I've been talking about, really, like, I want to say 10 or 15 years I've been yeah, talking about this. It's, well, it's been happening for a long time. That it's been, it's a really critical, critical problem, and I actually brought this up when you were trying to talk with your stepfather about mm-hmm. something, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm about to get the word wrong, but I think it's this epistemological closure. Yeah, where Ep- epi- you can also it's epistemic. usually shortened to epistemic. Yeah, this sort of epistemic closure yeah. where we no longer, as society, have shared reality. Right, right. There's no shared reality in our society where I read something. Right. I trust that it is true and that this is a reputable source. We all watched it on the news last night. We all watched so it on the news. So we're all going to discuss it. So we're all going to discuss it. And we all reasonably- It was on network news. <laughs> right. I mean, we all reasonably accept the validity of the network news and their legitimacy in reporting it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or even, and, and you can say that, oh gosh, we never should have trusted the news. And I think you're right. We never should have trusted the government. And I think you're right. But this is more pervasive. Yes. This is very deep. What about the encyclopedia? <laughs> okay? What about the dictionary? Well, and the meaning of words. Dictionaries clearly have a liberal bias. <laughs> right? But no, what about the meaning of words now? Yeah. Right? That's that's that like this, those things are actually up literally, literally up, up for, for debate. Grabs. It's yeah. up for de- up yeah. for debate and up for grabs. Yeah. Who's going to claim Who's going to well, claim what? What's where you're really see, seeing it now and this is starting to get well documented is this right-wing project to literally rewrite history. To rewrite history. And, that's, and this, is, this is all very dangerous. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you're the victor if you get to write history. Taking a, right? Well, here's the thing that historians say, is even taking a really strong, clear, unambiguous lesson from some historic of, uh, event, like the Civil War or whatnot, right. that's... To to real historians, that is a very fraught and problematic thing to do. It's, it is. Right. Because there's too much going on. You just can't take a single story or single lesson from historical no, events. No, there's there's a lot more going be, on. So when, when you see someone doing this, it's almost always a to sign serve their interest. Of, of an ideology at work. Right, right. So, th- so I think the epistemic closure thing is real and disastrous. Mm-hmm. And it's far deeper than our. It's. I mean, news bubbles don't begin to touch it. Right. I mean, down to the roots of what we believe and understand about the world we live in. Right. We no longer have shared reality around that. One of the things we talked about at the Socialism One Hundred and One was uh, someone in the in the not not a presenter said, "Wow, you really have to." Um, step far back to be able to see all these things that we just grow up with these ideas that we grow up with and i'm yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah you do you, do. you, you really, do. really do and it's not so easy you know no it's, it's very hard it's not and yeah it's like uh, it's like class consciousness it's fleeting right. and you're always you always gotta step back and slipping check. back into your routines you know right. So, so that aside your news bubble and fake news that's just a that's just a that's a red herring. That's not a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, come on. People say things that are funny all the time. People 
make up stories and in the United States it's legal to lie on the news so yeah since it's Reagan a, killed the fairness doctor right so it's something we do here there's a case with Monsanto where like right. 60 minutes or something found that you know they could just lie they it could just legal. lie it's legal for them to do so yeah. so you know that why is it you know so why is this a thing now it's a red herring because this is why social media and the rise of the consistent liberal this is the title of the article from title of the Fair. Article. Yeah. So, um, Jim Narekis. Yeah, Jim Narekis is the author. So the idea here is that um, the Pew Research Center released a survey on political attitudes by generation. America is politically sorted by generations in a way it never has before, was a takeaway. And y- you could say that, but it's not, it's not really news. It's been mm-hmm. that way for a long time, like mm-hmm. for more than 10 years, a couple of decades almost. And what's striking to uh, our friend Jim here is how voters of all generations have shifted to the left, mostly by becoming more consistently progressive, mostly in the last six or seven years. Amazing. <laughs> Look at that. Amazing what will happen when people yeah. of, f- of, of average means really start to suffer in the... Uh, in the, the neoliberal the, regime. In the late stage capitalist uh, yeah. um, collapse. So 10% of young people were consistently liberal in 2011. In 2017, 25% were. Mm-hmm. More than double. Generation X, um, from 9 to 16%, not, not quite double. Baby boomers, it was 7 to 17%. And even among the silent generation, right? So like my parents' generation. <laughs> um, These were, the, the silent generation were... Our folks were 73 to 90 now. And that was, um, those were... Between World there, War Two, they didn't fight in World War Two. No, they, but they, they're boom. But they're not yet boomers. They're not boomers. Right. They were too young to fight in World War Two. Well, actually, my dad fought in World. Well, was a conscientious objector to World War Two. Yeah. So he was old enough to fight. He was twenty years old at the time. Well, how old would he be today? He'd be ninety-seven now. Yeah. So so he's. So people who um, so so he was at the older okay, age, yeah. old, or the older range. People yeah. who were younger than that, they were too young to fight in World War II, but lived through it. People who were actually eighteen in World War II are in their nineties today. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so and so even that silent generation, uh, <laughs> they moved from seven to twelve percent as uh, voting con- or being consistently liberal, and. Um, Meanwhile, consistent conservatives did not show the same kind of growth. There was only a, like a single percentage point rise among Gen Xers and uh, the silent generation. And, um, and actually, I think it shrunk among millennials. So what's going on here, right? Hmm. Yeah. Um, previously, you may have noticed that um, when you polled people like in the 80s, like during, during Reagan's term, mm-hmm. and, that, and actually, I, I recall this from talking to people, uh, because you, you remember, I was a Republican at the time. Right. Right? Right. And, like, if you polled me, I did not, like, share ideology with the Republican Party. Yes. And if you polled Republicans in general, they didn't, like, share the party's platform. Yeah, yeah. They generally had some piece of the platform. I thought this was a great a great point he's making. Right. Yeah. And they didn't care too much about the other parts of the platform. Right. And together they formed a coalition and yeah. the, so the did Republican things. Party as as a whole was a voting block that was really a coalition. It was really it was a coalition. Of, of people with very different interests and beliefs. I mean, in really radically different interests yeah. and beliefs. Oftentimes like, many of them <laughs> yeah, seem, literally opposing uh, literally each opposing other. or seeming to be in conflict. Yeah. So I I was like a non interventionist. There were other people who were moralists. I, I was also a moralist and still am a moralist. Yeah. Um, so it it says uh, surprisingly that quote conservatives didn't really exist that is there was no significant group of voters that embraced what was then and now the overwhelming ideology of the Republican Party socially repressive and economically favoring the rich yeah there was no group of people that thought that right which is they yeah but that's their effectively their the party's ideology right now what now now this is what it's really interesting you fast forward about 25 years Mm -hmm. and suddenly you start to see this group emerge these staunch conservatives quote staunch conservatives who are who think this right they actually think this as an ideology unto itself and if you ask yourself what happened yep there was the rise of sort of right-wing radio and fox news and it 
became this sort of um, conservative talk radio became a huge thing. Rush Limbaugh, but no, it, it became a framework yeah. to give people an ideology around which they could build a scaffolding to for this to make sense as it, policy. It turned this diverse coalition into into true, a, true believers. True believers around this policy agenda that actually makes no rational sense for any like it's person. It's not as self-interest. No, it doesn't have any self-interest for any like for most, pers- of, for most people. For most people. For a very small elite, it's like obviously the only thing to do, right? <laughs> yeah. But for, um, for most people, this doesn't make any sense unless you've got some kind of ideological scaffolding to hang it off of, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what that function And that's that what served. that function it served. That's what talk radio <clears throat> served. Oops, that's what... Um, Fox News has done is to provide the scaffolding for this to be something to believe in as an ideology and not just a sort of a diverse Mm -hmm. coalition of people working to get. And that's why you have these folks who are pro-lifers who are just, I don't know, being drugged by the bus because they, they, they just keep voting Republican, and this time, they, this they, time they'll they end it. They keep telling them they're gonna. That now they're really gonna get to kick the football. You're gonna kick it this time, guys. Just hold still. I'm gonna hold the football right here, yep. and this is the time. Just wait. And you know, no one ever kicks it. Nope. It's not gonna happen. It's just, it's not gonna happen. So that evolution took place. There, where, m- meanwhile, during that period, there was no parallel development of this kind of mass media for exactly the, for the left for the left the and, left didn't have that and you know people tried like to get, well, no. to get like and if you think about it it can't happen here it, it can't happen it can't happen here because of the way things are paid for right and corporate sponsors we, are never going to yeah, support the, leftist radio closest we came for a while was actually air america, america. radio with like morning sedition <laughs> you know yeah spinning distance yeah right but that didn't last and that didn't have because any money because you need to fund this right. in our in this climate, and the only people who fund it are corporate sponsors who and don't the, want to fund an anti corporate agenda. Yeah, the money people right. pretty quickly pulled the plug on that. So yeah, I'm not funding an anti corporate agenda. What's right. wrong with me? Come right. on. Um, so that's not going to happen here. But what we saw happen and start to take root in the late 2000s, the late aughts, mm-hmm. uh, was social media, right? Where people could actually have direct access to all this uh, media. That was poorly funded, but out there, and these leftist ideas people could share person to person, and now people are like, yeah, sliding over to the left, and I'll be perfectly f- frank with you. Yeah, uh, there's a large number of my conservative friends because you know, I, I still have all these conservative friends, right? Right. Um, who are uh, in 2003, they were cheering on the Iraq War, right? Yeah. Yeah. By 2013, they they say male couple every day about over the Iraq but War. By 2013, they're actually talking about imperialism and anti colonialism. They're talking right? about imperialism, yeah. imperialism anti colonialism, and so on. Um, it's, it's pretty weird. And you know, in 2003, um, <clears throat> socialism is is uh, death and Stalin. And yeah, did right. you, can you did you look at Venezuela lately and all this other sort of right? I mean, just. Just the knee-jerk tropes about just socialism. Just sort of knee-jerk tropes about socialism. Um, and not engaging at all, and mind you, I have my own critiques, mm-hmm. but not engaging at all the reality mm-hmm. that we live in a system that already has a gulag. We live yes. in a system where people right. are starving. We live right. in that system right. now. And a lot of the institutions that we like, that are successful, <laughs> Medicare... Social Security, Security, our socialist programs, the and socialist were designed programs. that way from the outset. Right. And that Medicare works. Yeah. Social Security works. Right. So and maybe their socialist know, programs. So socialism actually maybe, maybe it works. For and everyone. maybe you know, and, you know, not not a go- not killing everyone. Not killing but, everyone. But helping everyone. Helping everyone out. And I'm I'm sure for some of them they would say, Well, maybe if we got rid of Medicare we could get rid of our gulags, right? Like they've got this kind of association somehow. <laughs> like they're there. That's where they're at. Um it's, well that's like the FEMA death camps. Or right, whatnot. right. The, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you know, Yes, we have concentration camps. They're not FEMA death camps, they're the detention centers at the border. Mm-hmm. Right? So yeah. we've got that, but I you know, you're mixing your metaphors here. Ice ice baby. Hey, hey. But it was the Gestapo. So Kamala these, Harris is a cop. <laughs> This is just breaking down into memes. Sorry. I haven't even gotten... Well, no, we're working on the article. We actually are there. We're just digressing. I'm not trying to derail you. <laughs> no, no. I think this is actually the reality we live in, and people who have a problem with socialism mm-hmm. 
historically have been in this headspace of just like, well, Stalin and death camps. Yeah. And yeah. not able to say, oh, by the way, Sweden and Denmark. Right. Right. You know? And now they're actually having a thoughtful, a lot of NHS, conservatives. Yeah. Right. Conservatives are having a much more rational conversation. They're like, well, you know, I, I think socialism could work in this way un- under these circumstances. Right. Rather conservatives than are saying Conservatives. This. Are saying this now? Horseshoe theory is real, folks. Yeah, or fish hook theory, theory or whatever real. you want. Well, yeah, that, you go far enough left, you end up, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the reality is, this proliferation of social media and these so-called bubbles, mm-hmm. the freedom of all this freaky ass fake news media to yes. get out there and say things, right, is actually influencing people to the left, yeah. and that's why centrists are freaking out about yes. fake news and yes. shutting it down yes that's all that's happening yeah there is no fake news there is no nothing going on except people talking to each other right that's what's going on people are talking to each other and like any conversation people say bullshit sometimes mm-hmm. yep. and then the people they're talking to say that sounds like bullshit what are you talking about and either they back it up or they don't or they move on and everyone learn something and grows a little bit but that doesn't mean we need to shut down conversation and that's all this fake news thing is about is about shutting down conversations yep and and it's going mainstream in that the these social media that enabled all this right are now cracking down on it cracking down on so that fake pe- news people that are fake news. people the people that i watch and enjoy um you know People like Jimmy Dore and whatnot, mm-hmm. you know, who often, or, and Christopher Hedges, you know. Black Agenda Report. Yeah. Bruce who, Dixon. Who have shows on um, RT, honestly, often, right. because they can't get a platform on American media. Right. They're being demonetized. They're losing followers. They're being shut down. Exactly. They're being purged on Twitter, on YouTube, YouTube. On, on Facebook. Facebook. Because of the fake news red herring. <sighs> well, under the guise of the fake, fake news, news red, red herring. herring. Yes. Now, this is fake news. What are you talking about? So, yeah, if Google runs all our infrastructure, who's going to tell the story of how Google is, is you know... Com, uh, Criminals? Like, contributing to, to drone strikes. To drone you know, attacks. Technology and AI to def- DOD drones. Who's going to tell that story? Right. Because, you know, Google's <sighs> the one that lets it pass. Yeah. So that's the whole agenda around fake news. And to take this one step deeper, uh, this leads me to the second article I think it connects to. This mm-hmm. article um, from 1976 called Trashing the Dark Side of Sisterhood. Yeah, this appeared in Ms. Magazine originally. In 1976. So it's, it's more than 40 years old. Yep. Just to be clear. So am I. <laughs> hey, so am I. But that said, there's, there's an, I'm not going to read too much of it. I think it's worth reading, but I don't want you to go too it's far quite, afield. It's quite long. I'm, I want. I don't want to take this quite too far afield. In 1976, people had longer attention spans. <laughs> well, and I also, this doesn't directly relate to the specific content of this article. Mm-hmm. But the thing she describes, this trashing, where, and l- let me see if I can summarize quickly what she's talking the about. Connections. The connections. Make, and make the connection. So... What would happen sometimes in feminist circles in the 60s and the 70s into the 80s is you'd be organizing, you'd be doing something in a particular city or place or thing, and you might have some some kind of success or notoriety, and then people would start trashing you. By trashing, we mean you're at a meeting, and you raise your hand to speak, everyone turns and listens to you politely, and then turns around Ignores and continues you. as though you have not spoken. Mm-hmm. You suddenly get dropped from the mailing list. You're not getting the mailings, and like, it turns out you're not on the mailing list. But you know, you signed up. Like, oh, that was just an honest mistake, and you know, you come up with an idea, and it's not possible. You're raising money so everyone can go on a trip, and then suddenly you want to go, and now every woman for herself. Mm-hmm. And taken individually, these things are trivial. Taken individually. It's it's, but yeah, it accumulates right. to this sort of like shunning. mean girl. It's, it's a shunning. Yeah. It's this mean girl bullying, right? And it's a shunning to isolate the person who's being trashed. And if people stand up for you in public, they get trashed too. Yeah. 
So it's very clear. Yeah. So that it's like a cont- trying to uh, start stop the spread of a contagion. Contagion, right? And um, she's like, the first two times it happened, I thought maybe I was saying something wrong. I was doing something wrong. And like by the third time, I was like, hey, you know. This is a thing. It says it took three trashings to convince me to drop out. To just drop out. Finally, at the end of 1969, I felt psychologically mangled to the point where I knew I couldn't go on. Until then, I interpreted my experiences as due to personality conflicts or personality or political disagreements, yeah. which I could rectify with time and effort. But the harder I tried, the worse things got. Until I was finally forced to face the incomprehensible reality that the problem was not what I did, but what I was. But her herself. Right, yeah, yeah. and that's um, so. This is an interesting thing, right? It's a psychological manipulation mechanism, and that's all any bullying form is. Form of gaslighting. Right, it's a form of gaslighting. It's a type. It's a type of bullying, right? And <clears throat> what you see right now, really across the political spectrum, but I see it much more now amongst liberals. Right. Yeah, it's happening on Facebook a lot with my. In your liberal circle, my friends, in all the liberal circles that I'm watching, right, and not actually really like a, a, a germane part of, this is it's a real thing, right? It's this real sort of vicious yeah, thing yeah. that if you don't tow the party line or have appropriate dissent, mm-hmm. then you're just persona non grata. Yep, you're just not part of anything you're doing, and in fact, in fact. You're part of the problem. Can I read a little bit more here? Please, go right ahead. Over the years, I have talked with many women who have been trashed. Like a cancer, the attack spread from those who had reputations to those who were merely strong, from those who were active to those who were merely had ideas, from those who stood out as individuals to those who failed to conform rapidly enough to the twists and turns of the changing line. And I think that's an important point is, you know, you can be at the center of the, the group Mm-hmm. But if the group all runs off like a pack of baying hounds to follow a squirrel, and you're like, wait a minute, there's no squirrel over there's there. There's no squirrel over there. You're left behind, and then now you're not a member of the, the group. group anymore. So with each new story, my conviction grew that trashing was not an individual problem brought on by individual actions, nor was it a result of political conflicts between those of different mm-hmm. ideas, differing ideas. It was a social disease. Yes. Yes, and I and this is I don't want to give um, I'm not trying to give uh, uh, conservatives or folks on the right a pass. Um, I see it there too. It's it's um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's different. It's different. Yeah, it's different. It's not quite so brazen. It's not the circular firing squad that people do on the right, left. Right. Right. Because basically, conservatives really do cover their own even when they clearly do deserve to they, be they deserve to be ostracized you know it's just like the roy moore thing you know People clearly his him. behavior is deserved is is you know by by I mean, uh, any standard that i'd consider rational is clearly way outside sure outside about anything you could support but people stood up for him because he's a conservative he's a conservative he's that's, on our team that's all i, I hear know. that I hear that all, all the, the time. time. So, so right. it is different. There are certain litmus tests, and if you pass the litmus test, you're good. That's yeah. how it is with so conservatives. So Trump has to mention uh, mention that he's a Christian. He has to mm-hmm. mention that he's a Christian. He has to be pro-life. He has to be pro-gun. Has he done that? Okay. Well, and that, and that's, that, but that you know. facade is cracking now because yeah. you can't maintain this this joke. You know? <laughs> this joke. I know. It's, a, it's funny on, to on me. Any to do with, issues, on honestly. any of those issues. On any of those issues. <laughs> so, uh, any, anywho, but that's really it. There's a litmus test. You pass the litmus test. It's okay. And now, mind you, if you have any dissent on the litmus test, then it can get ugly, right? Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. have to find your little. So, like you're you're like a pro-choice Republican. You got to go find your corner because we're going to keep the big tent, and we're going to have you at election time. But yeah. you're actually not welcome in yeah. our parties. Right. Right. And they would still, and, but they'll still vote. And they'll still vote, right? right. <laughs> so that's that was the assumption. So it's different on the right. It's a little bit, yeah. right? But that so that's uh, 
so it's a little bit different on the right. It's a little, di- right. a little bit different amongst conservatives. But this phenomenon among liberals, which people like popularly refer to as the circular firing squad, right? Um, this I think is this really this article is insightful about how long that's been. A, this has a been problem. a thing for yeah, a long, right. long time, and I'm sure it goes way back before this. But it was a good snapshot of this woman's thinking at the time. At the time, and so. The thing I think I want to connect here and want to bring into relief or into high relief is that what sh- this is what you're watching unfold with fake news. Mm-hmm. And this is what you're watching unfold, to be honest, with climate change and lots of other liberal standbys. Yeah. Like, will you dissent? In what way? Right. So you're a denier. Right. Huh. You right. know, and it, it gets ugly fast. And, and now we're seeing the, um, the, the standard that you have to uphold, the standard ideology is is the is Russia Gate? Is Russia Gate? Now is you got you have to you have to join in if you haven't joined in to this to this neo McCarthyism. Well, well then you, you're a Trump supporter, aren't you? Then you're a Trump supporter because you know Russia. It just it, and it's, it's this it's thing. It's gotten, bizarre. It's gotten very sick very fast. It's yes. really frightening. Honestly, yes. it's frightening to watch unfold. And and really honestly, it uh, makes me deeply grateful. These people did not win the White House. Yeah. I mean, yeah. seriously? You were the people that wanted the White House. Looks like we dodged a bullet. And so so far, I, I mean, I get attacked on this, but when I push back at all and say, you know, here's what I believe about the Trump administration, yeah. and here's what I believe about Russia's role and whatnot, you know, Rickets. it's they leave. Silence. They, like, wander away. I'm being trashed. Yes. Yeah. So, ignored. Because I'm a defective leftist. Defective, yeah. Well, yeah. Defective liberal. Well, no, you're far, you're far left. Oh yeah, now, now that's the thing is that apparently uh, anyone who vo- supported Sanders was on was on the far left, <laughs> as yeah. if America had a far, far left. left. Like, okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. So, thanks for your insight. Anyway, so th- they just wander, they leave the conversation in disgust or whatnot. But yeah, because not going to dignify that with a response. So, so now there's a thing hmm. like the, uh, well, have you seen the new indictments? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've seen Mueller's indictments. He's indicted nine Russian nationals who live in yeah, Russia. Joe Stein's going to prison for this. Who live in Russia, who worked for a company that prom- like developed content for these Facebook memes or whatnot. But no, seriously, what the hell's wrong with you? You think Joe Stein needs to go to prison? <sighs> How, but but what's how do you think that this is somehow uh, how does this bring down the Trump administration or neoliberalism uh, <laughs> or so, anything that needs to go down or anything that needs to go down so like are Where we, we going are we this? actually going to extradite a bunch of Russian citizens who went Damn to, who, who who worked <laughs> posting memes on Facebook right <laughs> we're going to extradite them and sh- somehow get Putin to you know send them here and we're going to charge them with crimes it's not treason because they're not americans Americans. so right it's some some there's some international but these these crimes are they're all like administrative they're administrative they're bureaucratic they're diplomatic bureaucratic crimes jesus (laughs) i'll show you bureaucratic so like so like but again i mean so let's say everyone who worked on the campaign does go to jail okay how does that bring down the trump administration it doesn't (sighs) it serves to reinforce yeah their tribal identity right because all this going on you know trump administration is completely corrupt in every way he's he's the emolument president he is so impeachable yeah right but i'd be a congress that will impeach him but that's only congress can take him out now it's not even clear if he can be charged Charged. and convicted of some kind of high crime but no here's the thing this is why it's never happened it would cause a constitutional crisis crisis. and this is why no one will answer you i mean the the sort of trashing aside right right because it's ahistorical to think that he'll be taken down by a crime unless he resigns all of nixon i don't think he has that much much humility (laughs) (laughs) yeah people don't people don't remember well they don't remember anything honestly but But they don't remember that clinton was impeached and Didn't served resign. out his term. Yeah, served out the rest of his right? term. Nixon impeached was impeached, impeached, and he resigned. Right. He because was he, not, had, he had more humility than Trump or Clinton. He was not convicted and removed no. from office no. as a matter of law, although there was a there was a threat on the table. Yeah, there was a threat. And, and I think that's why he yeah, resigned. There Just was to be definitely clear, a threat on the table. I don't actually think of Nixon as a humble guy. No, right. no, of course not. But there was a very clear threat on the table, which like, we're, this is going to trigger a constitutional crisis. crisis. 
and he resigned rather than go do through that. that rather than do it. Right. Um, no, no. This is the thing that people don't want to talk about if they pursue this conversation to its logical, rational end. Yeah. This Russia Gate thing that is not a thing. Yeah. Is not going to do anything about anything anyone cares about except. Yeah censor the left more severely and push the conversation to the right. So, yeah. Uh-huh. And that's the goal. That's the game plan. And that's all we're trying to do here. And, you know, maybe start a war. Um, Cause you know, we all, we all profit from that. Don't we? Are you, are you fall? You know, we're, I don't, again, we're getting a field again, but no, this is really the heart and soul. Of what I'm getting at. Here. Are you following the um, investigation over this nerve agent poisoning in the UK? Yeah, what's going on there? Uh, this former um, spy, mm-hmm. basically, you know about Litvin, Litvin, Litvinenko? Is that his? Yeah, I think that's his name. The guy who was killed by um, polonium in his teapot. Oh yeah, that that's a fascinating story. There's a book out about that which I'd love to read. It's really a true crime. Like, you know, you couldn't. Um, it's right out of a, a James Bond, a James Bond novel, movie, right. a novel. It's it's total Cold War paranoia, and it happened recently. Yes, right. Well, this is another one. Apparently, mm. somebody poisoned this guy and his daughter with a nerve agent, and we don't know even which nerve agent because they haven't released that. It wasn't sarin. It wasn't VX. Or, um, I think that's oh, what you call it. But um, they're like. Uh, people in hazmat suits boarding up restaurants and city parks and whatnot, trying to make sure that none of this stuff is still out there for the public, ready to poison people because this stuff is incredibly toxic. Yeah, yeah. It's, and so this was a a fellow who who do we think poisoned? He was a spy. He, oh, was, he was a, a spy. he was a like a retired spy or whatnot. A retired spy. Someone well, the implication out. is that the Kremlin poisoned him because oh, and just oh, because the 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 government. Like to get your hands on polonium, you got to you have somebody. to be a government. You got to know somebody, right? Right. But and this, so this is. I should also just say this to be clear before somebody like Russia gates us or I don't yeah. know what the hell. Yeah. Um. Some kind of more lunacy about right. Who knows what? Um. Putin. Putin is um, he's a bad man. <laughs> I'm trying not to just swear incoherently. Yes, he's not a nice. He's, not, He's a nice, not a nice man. man. He's not a good guy. No, I mean we um, don't believe that. You I, I know, don't, I don't we think, don't believe that, that. That he's a fucking monster. Okay, he's a monster. He's an absolute monster. There's no, and there's no, there's no doubt about doubt that. about that. There's no That's sense in which his reputation is undeserved. We're not no. actually defending Putin. No, I don't. We may be trying to prevent a needless, a needless war. conflict war. Yeah. And so let's let's break this down even further. Yeah. There's the there's what's going on domestically right. where. All forces are on deck to stop this leftward shift in the populace. Mm-hmm. We can all smell it. We can all see it. Yep. And yep. leftists are starting to find each other. Yeah. So all hands are on deck. And so and so to push the back social hard. media that enabled so many people to kind of we're shutting that down. Become like to learn about like, to learn the about strikes, each other. To learn about the the, the exactly. Occupy Wall Street, the police That's shootings, how these the, strikes, BLA, the Black Lives the West Virginia, yeah. the West Virginia strike, Black That's Lives Matter. That's how the matter. strikes are forming. That's how they're forming. Right. These people are setting up Facebook groups, and they have tens of thousands of members yeah. in days. Yeah. Right. You're so, listening to a social media post. Post right. So this. They're working to shut that down. That's the domestic angle, right? right? Which is why my, this is actually why this podcast is not hosted on anything other than the own, our own server that we pay for. Yeah. And it's not um, listed on iTunes. Yeah. Through Apple. So that's why. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to keep the signal alive. Yeah. Because if it is, you know, if it does get, um, flagged as fake news flagged or voted down or, or whatnot Whatever. or then people who find you via apple Can't through apple through anymore. the apple store they won't find you anymore and so right. you know apple giveth and apple taketh, taketh away. away so I, I just would rather avoid that whole thing that although my old podcast it is listed mm-hmm. through the itunes store you can find it all the but most of them have been deleted anyway. They're just so here's the, archive right. stuff now. So this is the domestic front for this whole uh, fake news yeah. thing. Yeah. And the, all this sort of like 
so-called liberal pushback against the so-called far left. Yeah. Right? There's also a, a foreign policy agenda at work here. Oh, yeah. What, what I'm sorry. What, what really galled me and made me laugh out loud was um, one of my friends referring to the far left as useful idiots because oddly enough that's just how i think of centrists <laughs> yes <laughs> so you know whatever you know useful idiot yeah that's, and you're a useful idiot. idiot well you're a useless idiot <laughs> where does it go from there, where does it go from there? What's the, this is our debate we're just calling <sighs> names now um the point here's, well here's a name too for the regarding the, the poisoning of yeah. this of this x by false flag operation <clears throat> yeah. but then anyway, let's move on let's move on um, as as a foreign policy issue, there's this little thing going on in Syria called a civil war. Yes. And one side of the civil war is being supported by Russia, and the other side of the civil war is being supported by the United States. We support the rebels, and Russia supports the empire. The, the empire. <laughs> the, well, the, the the government. Right. Of and. I would even go as far as saying the legitimate government of, of Syria. Mm-hmm. And um, now mind you, it's, this is a civil war. Civil wars are ugly and there are atrocities. And personally, I don't think we should be involved. Personally, right. I, I don't right. think we should be there. That's, but that that's said, becoming the, the left consensus is that we just shouldn't be involved should in be any involved way. In any way. But that said, we can't pick winners and losers in this kind of thing. We are supporting the rebels there, mm-hmm. and Russia supporting the government there. Right, and that's a little situation known as a proxy, proxy war. war. Yeah, it's just the United States. So the United States right now is fighting Russia in a proxy war. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the folks that are pushing the fake news agenda yep. want to turn that into a hot war. They do because they profit. And I know, listen, just G- listen. I know, general elect. Oh, they're, they're owners, the owners of these media the organizations. Owners of the, they profit. profit. So, and I know that seems like... Cynical? Like cynical or just, I don't know. Seriously? That's crazy. That's crazy. No, that's actually it. Yeah. yeah. If we get into a hot war, they make money. Well, I mean, why was... Why or did the... Um, did the, the Democratic media establishment support... The Iraq war in Iraq, war. right? Well, this is why because, because they profit. Both Democratic and Republican institutions earn money profit when we go to war, right? So they're trying to find some purchase in the American populace to bring us into another live hot war. Yeah, yeah. And if you can get enough people who self-identify as liberal mm-hmm. head up about Russian interference and make you know just like half a case right like just you know just half of an emotional case of an appeal people to are actually still, engage russia in war people are still you know generations of people now living are still in, living in a cold war mentality still yes. living in a john birch society yes. world you know but the russians are out to get us and yeah. we've got to do everything to yeah stop their expansion in the western hemisphere <clears throat> yeah it's true so there we are, and they're bringing us back. And that, why do you think we're using McCarthy area red scare tactics? Exactly. Because we're doing that. That's what we're doing. Yep. And we're trying to bring ourselves into this war space where a hot war with Russia is plausible somehow yeah. to Americans. I mean, we can't, like, we haven't reached this stage where people can say... Well, no, this isn't even true. People are talking now about a winnable nuclear war again. Yes. They're talking about it in the context of North Korea. But, yes. But, you know, again, like, which is another front yeah. to broach, right. Russia's in Asia, to broach the Asian continent in a hot war. Yes. Because, again, they profit. To lower our, sort of, um, the barrier to entry. Yeah. So that... Trump can get the authorization he needs from Congress to do this and basically back him into a political corner where he has to, Mm -hmm. to save face. Because right now, the foreign policy agenda around this bullshit is that, you know, you're not going to attack Russia? What are you, some kind of puppet for Putin? (laughs) That's what it sounds like. I mean, really, that, that's the argument. Th- this has become... It's like a schoolyard, so you're not going to punch him? This what, is, are you a pussy? Come on, is, man. This is actually what the Beltway consensus sounds <laughs> like it. right now. 
puppet for Putin is like being cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, you know? Uh, it, really? It's that demented. It's that absurd. And I don't know. I, I guess if you get swept up in this, I, I don't know what to say for you, but good luck, America. Go you. <laughs> Saving the world one... One nuclear bomb at a time. time. <laughs> so, uh, this, so this is why... This is why the... the, the this, this is why uh, social media matters. Social media matters and why this sort of uh, historical context of, of like pushing people out of groups and and um, and kind of, kind of like you know, this sort ostracizing of people. Person to person bullying and ostracizing is, and shutting down of is, ideas. It's significant. It's significant. Yeah. It's significant. It's how we push the public consensus into the space for war. Yeah. If you could have a yeah. rational conversation with your friend who's saying, I don't think Russia's a thing. Yeah. Maybe you wouldn't find yourself being, yeah, bomb him. Like a madman, right? Because that's the only way you'll believe that Trump is not a Putin ally, is if he bombs him. <laughs> but that's the situation. Yeah. That's that's how we're setting up the chessboard right now, and it's looking like it's going to be it's, an ugly game. It's ugly. It's it's scary. And even if you know, even if we we don't manage a hot war or more proxy wars. We don't need another Cold War. Yeah, no, that's not going to be good either. Let's I mean, go. people make money on Cold War military buildups yeah, too, they right? Love, yeah, the Cold War was, was good money for a long time. Yeah, and that the Cold War, people forget that that means hair trigger risk of... A nuclear war. A nuclear war. A yeah, nuclear Cold War. Wars can go hot very fast. Very that's, fast. That's the idea. So... Um, and nearly did. Nearly did. You know, many times. Several times. We don't need to go back. We don't right. need to go back. But, you know, hell do well, I know. Well, even though we never really left, given that we still have our Arsenal. arms, you know, we're still two minutes to midnight or whatever the clock is set out now. Yeah. It's not long. So that was my, that was my thing. Yeah. That's, that's what I thought was important. That's a good thing. Yeah. You know. okay. There are other things I think are important, but that's what I was going to talk that's, about today. Yeah. We, we wind up with a pile of articles. Yeah, there's so much, and, and I'm that, trying not to just do the like the bullshit, whatever like is hot this week, right? Like, so ooh, we, so, ooh. But we wind up with a pile of articles, and then you and I going through it. Like, what do you think? What do you want to talk about? I don't Let's know. Talk what do you want to talk about? Yeah. So, this was what we chose this week. So there it is. Um, so yeah, try not to get sucked in. You know, try not to get sucked in. Try and take a Plant step back and, and take a, a realistic. Have a realistic idea of what's possible as far as the Mueller investigation and all that and what oh, it's really stuff. saying about... Yeah. I mean, yeah, there are definite bad actors and there are very corrupt people in Washington. Like, yeah, that's, that's just, new. You know? Yeah, that's not news. Right. That's not actually news. Right. That Washington's corrupt. But look at what Russia's actually accused of doing and consider and what absurd. we do and consider some rationality behind it. Some rational way yeah. to approach this or, yeah. or manage this. Right. The... Um, um, I really feel like it would be so nice if we could get back to talking to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and well, I, yeah. That, I think that's what we're trying to do with this organizing. Well, I think what we're trying to do to start talking yeah. to each other again. I'm, it's the the socialism thing's a little hard for me because I'm not actually a socialist, but you know. Yeah. Well. Well, not even hard. It I just, don't like. It's hard for me to even pin down where I am, but I I like what the socialists have to say. Largely. Oh, uh, that's, I guess that's where the thing, the reason I keep coming back, yeah. though, is the socialists are the only people having a reasonable conversation right now. Right. And the DSA, uh, reasonable critique. Reasonable you know? critique, right. And, and the DSA is not very ideological, right? It's like no. Big Ten. It's like, you know, let's yeah. talk about, let's talk about pra practical ends and strategy and not yeah. are you ideologically pure enough to be. Right. Now, they're very much like, us. let's let's stop the evictions. How about that? Yeah. And they're growing. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Anyway. so, you know, jump on board. It could be good. <laughs> I'm not yet a card-carrying member of the party, but uh, I'd like to have a card that said official socialist organizer, so maybe soon. Maybe soon. I don't know. All right. We're going to do a review of a movie. Oh, that's right. We have that coming up. I'm like, there's another thing. There's, there's another, another thing. thing. What's the other thing? Oh, it's the review. And I'm going to try desperately to make this quick, but um, <laughs> stop laughing. Stop laughing. <laughs> yeah, she knows me too well. Okay, A Wrinkle in Time. So a few things about this movie. Um, first of all, I'm a, a long-time Madeline L'Engle fan. Yeah. I have not read all her books, but I've read The Wrinkle in Time books. There mm -hmm. are several. 
Um, I think I it, actually didn't realize it was like more than one. More than one. Yeah, Ma- I've mainly the first three: I, the swiftly tilting planet and the wind in the door. I've read those more than once, mm-hmm. and a wrinkle in time, of course. Um, and I've read them not only repeatedly as a kid, but recently as an adult because I read them to the kids. Although this was more than a few years ago, and they don't remember it. Yeah, long so enough that yeah, it wasn't it time, present in their memory. Time to read it again. Anyway, so this movie. Yeah. A production budget of one hundred million dollars. This film, you know, that's not so, so big when you consider like Avatar. Yeah, it's a lot of bank, you know. Yeah, it's a lot, this it's a lot is of bank, this film is the first, according to Wikipedia, the first live action film with a nine digit budget to be directed by a woman of color. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a breakthrough to celebrate, mm. I think. Mm. But it is really unfortunate that this nine-digit budget and a woman of color did not produce a great movie mm. and we're going to talk a bit about why so uh storm reed is uh the the girl that played meg murray mm-hmm. um she's biracial mm-hmm. she's um uh, i thought i just want to point out that my critique of the movie does not really exp- extend to the child actors no, yeah. She, yeah. I thought, was was really very good in this. Mm-hmm. My critique of her role extends to her the lines she was given to read and the way she was directed to to perform read, them. Right. right. Levi Miller, Calvin O'Keefe, very charismatic uh, white kid. Mm-hmm. Um, no complaints he did a great job Mm -hmm. Very, a very fine child actor Derek McCabe Charles Wallace Murray he was eight years old when he did this role Mm -hmm. right no complaints people are talking about his character and I think they're transferring from the character to the actor like because they didn't like his character Um, but I thought he did an amazing job given the lines he was asked to read Mm mm-hmm and it's and I can't actually imagine finding an eight year old kid who could possibly have done a better job. Right. I mean, maybe there's one kid out there, one or kid somewhere, but maybe you know. I, so just to be clear, I thought these kids did great work. Mm-hmm. Um, so the movie is a kind of a mess. Uh, it works emotionally at some levels in some scenes. Many people who saw it, even the people who are giving it negative rev- reviews, say, "Oh yeah, I did find myself tearing up." in a couple mm-hmm. places because of these moving scenes yeah, uh, with Meg and her father or her mother because mm-hmm. it's a tearjerker in many ways, in many places, mm-hmm. right? And it does these standard manipulative things to your feelings that, that works. You yeah, know? yeah. So they knew how to do some of those things. But it has a number of strange failures in storytelling and there are problems at a lot of different levels. So yeah. when I was done... I couldn't easily just say, oh, well, Bad this one thing was wrong. Right. Or this one thing was badly wrong. If only this thing had been better, it would have been a better movie. Right. Because there were multiple sort of interlocking things that were right. wrong with it. It's actually interesting. It's an interesting right. failure. Right. Right. It's not a complete failure because it, it's a good enough movie that a lot of ki- like kids who don't know the story will probably be attached to the heroine. Right. And pick up the book. And pick up the book. And they'll be entranced enough by the story to consider it a fun movie to watch. Mm -hmm. Even though uh, it really, as far as I'm concerned, could have been far better. Right. So... Like, you were saying it it actually just didn't make sense in lots of places. Yeah, I'm I'm going to get to that. But, so... The source material, this uh, the original book, it's a relatively short book. It was written really hurriedly, and mm-hmm. it shows in the grammar. Of the book. Like, it's actually, in some places, very roughly written and edited. Mm-hmm. But it came, like you can imagine, it kind of came out in an inspired rush, and yeah. and the author did not want to kill that energy. inspiration right. and energy. 
Right. So it, but it does have a raw feel as far as copy editing and whatnot. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I don't mean it was full of typos. That's not what I mean. I mean, just yeah. like the way the sentences tumble over each other. You right. know, it it has this like, like in the process you would revise some of those things and publish. Right. It. None of those things were revised out of this. That's what it feels like. Right. Um, the characters. There's a nerdy, relatable character who's Meg. Mm-hmm. Like you can really identify with. There's a good-hearted, not so nerdy, relatable character. Right. That's Calvin. Calvin. He's not a not member a of the Murray family. He's not a, a super math genius. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's an extremely nerdy character that's hard to relate to, who is actually a child prodigy. Right. Charles who is Wallace. unrelatable. That's the character. He is deliberately unrelatable. Right. But portrayed as brilliant like unnervingly brilliant to everyone who right. meets him discomforting yeah he's supposed to be that way that's the he's point. supposed to be unrealistic he's supposed to be unbelievable like, like you and if you've lines? ever yeah. been around like a real prodigy mm-hmm. it's like that it's, it's a little unnerving it makes you doubt yourself yes <laughs> it makes you feel s- slow and stupid <laughs> <laughs> right and that that those people exist. Yeah, they're rare. They're, not, they're rare. Yeah, they're not fake. Yeah, even you know we've got some brilliant kids, but none of them are Charles like Wallace brilliant. Yeah, uh, none of them like that. Yeah, there's only a handful of kids like him in, in the world in a given time. Right. You know, so uh, the original was actually a Christian allegory and a Christian parable about light fighting against darkness. It was played out across the whole history of the universe. Mm-hmm. And one of the fascinating things about it and the sequels is that the battle is played out across different scales. So this is a recurring theme in the book is that size doesn't matter. Mm -mm. You know, things can, a battle that's a turning point between the, you know, battle of good and evil, the war between good and evil can be played out on an intergalactic scale or inside your cells, right? Literally. On a cellular, right. Yeah. There are three characters, uh, in the book, they're sort of witches. They show up in human form. In the book, they're revealed to be stars that have given up their form as stars and exploded in order to take out the enemy, in order to fight evil. Right. They've basically gone kamikaze. Yeah. And after they're no longer stars, they can still like incarnate in aberrate. human form to one degree or another, but they're basically spiritual beings. Mm-hmm. So they are billions of years old, and they've given up literally almost everything in this fight and they can manifest um this idea is ignored in the film yeah they don't pick it up at all at all it's a big idea Actually, it's a big idea and it's such an inspirational idea that other books have picked this up or other media has picked this up so you and i watched this tv show called andromeda yes years ago there's a character in in now i should say andromeda is a hot mess it's terrible oh it's a complete failure it's, it's a, a disaster Just, yeah, it's a complete disaster oh lord but some of them are interesting well no and what's really this is what's interesting about andromeda so it's a complete <laughs> failure but it had so much promise it had so much promise though like the it could first, have been it could the have first been couple great. episodes were great and then it yeah, it Just goes off the rails, hell. and in the oh, later God. seasons, they like forced out the head writer, and his whole story arc and vision for Just it went collapsed. with him and it collapsed. Yeah, and, oh, it was so sad. Yeah, yeah, but no, Andromeda, the you picked up the. There's the, a character called Trance Gemini. Yeah, who is this humanoid alien? <laughs> who you find out is also a star, actually a star. Yeah, and her race of beings exists as stars, as stars. and can also manifest as humans, and she can blow herself up in battle. As needed. As a supernova. Oh, and the, we're bringing a lot to the table. <laughs> they even refer to her ability to fold time and space, travel through time and space as a, as a tesseract. As a tesseract. Right. They take that directly from, the, from a wrinkle in time. Right. right. They lift that whole. So, metal. yeah. So, the series is bad, but, I mean, Madeline Lengel's ideas have influenced a lot of a lot writers. Of science, a lot of science yeah. fiction. A lot of writers in general. So there's a famous section in the in the book where they travel to this planet called Kamazots. Well, mm-hmm. you might remember that this was written in 1962. Yep. And um, there was a little thing happening Ooh. called Camelot, Camelot. Yes. Which was the Kennedy administration. administration. Right. Um, Kamazots is an allegory of the post-war suburban build-out and the culture of conformity in the yes. suburbs. And... Uh, it was written, Wrinkle in Time was written in 5960, 
and um, the post-war suburbia thing was still pretty new and yeah. seemed very ominous. And I think we were right. To, she was right to be <laughs> unnerved honest. by it, honestly. That's weird. Um, but it was a very different culture, is my point. So to get a little sense for the culture, consider how, if you've seen the first few episodes of Mad Men, mm-hmm. but then go back a few years. Yeah, a few years further back. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would say Happy Days, but that's not very realistic. No. Right? Well, actually, here's the thing that I've often found is instructive. Uh-huh. Uh, what people are imagining when they say the 50s, yes, they're imagining the 60s. Mostly that's yeah. true, yeah. When people are imagining the 60s, they're right. imagining the 70s. The early 70s, right. yeah. Right. So the this 50s was actually much the more late like, 50s. Yeah this, is, yeah, this is late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. And it's what people have in their brains when they are, are imagining... The 40s. Uh, no, when they're imagining um, the 60s. That's what... When they're imagining the 50s, that's actually the 60s. Right. This sort of... When you're thinking about the 40s, the post-war era, yeah. that's much more what the 50s looked like. Yeah. With... Yeah. The music and the pool skirts and the, yeah. Right. So it's, anyway, so just Madeline Lengel's interest in the novel, the structure of the novel, the the Christianity of the novel, the mm-hmm. allegories and, and the themes and all that, even the various themes of liberation and warfare and victory and whatnot, right. they're not the same as those things are in 2018 her brand of what she probably wouldn't even have called feminism at the time it has very little to do with empowerment and feminism of 2018 2018 no but so we'll move on okay so the movie it takes the general structure of the source material but it discards the christian elements almost completely Mm -hmm. right um they even drops one of my favorite quotes from the book which is uh the light burns in the darkness and the darkness has never put it out, which is one of my, it's really something that inspires me. It's a biblical, mm-hmm. you know, verse. I mean, it's phrased in different ways. Right, but it's, yeah, it's deeply biblical. Right. And that's, that's an important moment in the book. Yeah. And it's lost. The three witches are, they're now called the misses because yeah. witches, I don't know, sexist or something. I don't know. In the book, I, I don't know exactly how much this is true. It's been a while since I've reread it, but um, they, the ages of the three witches kind of follow this sort of trilogy of archetypes, right. like the maiden, the mother, and the crone, like the three mm-hmm. stages of womanhood. Right. You know, uh, in the movie, they're all basically the same age, hmm. which and none of them look old, hmm. which is a thing. What's that about? That's, you can't look old. Oh, <laughs> that's not how we're gonna roll. It's an no. That's. Okay, that choice in creating the movie is anti-feminist. Feminist. Yes, it's fundamentally anti-feminist. Yeah, I'm kind of sick with it. Okay, <laughs> and you know, Oprah is so plastered with makeup, right? That you know, the, uh, anyway, she's not allowed to have any wrinkles. Let's just say, yeah, so, which is wrong. As well as the the kind of ridiculous uh, teeny bopper costuming. Uh, costuming the Swarkowski crystals on her brow and like the the silver lip gloss yeah. and all these anyway well, you didn't like the makeup <sighs> it's, whatever so it, it it becomes a story in the movie almost entirely about uh, the self-esteem and empowerment of meg hmm. and that is a theme in the book yeah, that's there. Meg's gaining confidence through confrontation and success, <clears throat> uh, interacting with the world and all that, and the support of her family, her brother, and her friend Calvin, mm-hmm. and that's her there. awakening sexuality. You know, it's all there. that's all there. And her development is an important theme in the book. Yes, but it's not couched in the self, the language of the self help movement. Right. Well, which it's kind of perverse. Well, we can do that another time. But it's a little bit perverse. Bit perverse. Um, yeah. So the rescue. And cooperation aspects kind of fall by the wayside, um, including the deletion of this concept of a psychic connection between the characters. Mm. Solidarity. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, it's called kithing, where right. they can they can communicate each other's th- thoughts to each other directly. Right. Right. That's just deleted. You're not going to use That's that. an amazing fantasy element that mm-hmm. I think. I really loved in the original book, and I think most people who read it Enjoyed really it. loved that element, the right. idea that you could have a secret friend you could communicate with, with without no one else could see no your mouth see your moving. Or no, or anything. <laughs> right. No, and, we, and again, we see it in other... People pick this up and use it all over the place now. It was even in uh, Spy Kids. Sure. Right? You know, it's a thing. Yeah, yeah, Junie and... and um, 
Oh gosh, I'm blanking on your name. Yeah, though they they communicate psychically. Psychically, right? It's it's just a, and that's I I don't know that hers was hers wasn't the first. No, no book to to propose this kind of psychic communication, but I mean it was an important important part of the story. Yeah. So also Calvin, the white male character, his role is considerably diminished. Hmm. The older white male character, um, the, the, like a like the love interest. He's not. It's not a. Uh, it's like a pre-romantic love interest. Yeah, yeah. Because she's a pre-teen kind of. She's mm-hmm. twelve or thirteen, I think. Yeah. Um, and so it's not portrayed as like you know. She wants to jump Calvin's bones, but there's clearly a thing going on. Right. So anyway, um, he's diminished. He's diminished. Uh, their relationship's a little more sexualized with their long See, hugs. Just a little. Yeah, I don't know about, right? about that. Yeah. It's still sort of Disney compliant. Right. Well, I, when I, and I say love interest. Yeah. You know, I like in Ponyo, they're five years old. Like that's a love interest, right? A, that's a form of love interest. Right. I, I, I don't he loves this mean, little girl. Right. I don't mean this is sexualized exactly. It, it's In that case, it's way too early yeah. for it to be sexualized right in a wrinkle in time it's on the verge of that yeah yeah but yeah anyway but they moved a little further than I a might little remember. bit because also i mean just imagine just remember attitudes about sex and marriage and all that too that you know that they would start courting right you know yeah um so meg's relationship to her father is disneyfied and by this i mean what they do in Disney movies, including shows like iCarly. Yeah, movies and, and their and, and their, their shows. TV shows. Right. Oh. Where for the for the um kids to grow, for the kids to develop as characters, the adults have to be shrunk. Right. They have diminished, to be undercut. Undercut, trashed, removed entirely. Mm-hmm. Um so she starts out the movie starts out uh, exploring her memories of and her deep love for her father and mm-hmm. vice versa. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of the movie, she perceives him as a selfish coward. Hmm. She finally rescues him, but and then events that happen after that lead to her absolute disgust and dismay with him hmm. to the point where there's this visible pulling away where she like withdraws all her love from him and then kind of gradually maybe gives him back a little bit. Like, all right, yeah, all you're right. still my dad. I'll give you a hug. Uh, but it's not going to be anything like it ever was before. before. Oh, that's <laughs> that's not in the book. <laughs> it seems a little bit. So you want to see your characters grow. Well, sure, and one of the things that child characters do in stories is they realize, they come to realize that the adults in their life are flawed. Well, they're flawed. They're real people. They're they real have people. Too. They have shortcomings. Right. Um, you know, I knew kids in college who hadn't learned that yet. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, I always believe everything my dad that's tells old. me. He's always right. Like, Dude. wow. Dude. <laughs> wow, really? Dude, I couldn't even talk. imagine. We gotta talk. Thinking that, you know, like, I just had like students in a class I was TAing just look at me with, you know, completely doe eyed, doe eyed, you know, like and say things like this and like, okay. okay. Um, Cause, yeah. So, which which of Piaget's development stages are, 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 you, are, are you currently stupid. at? Just because okay. I thought I was talking to a young adult, you know. But, yeah, whatever. Um, anyway, so th- that's something you would kind of expect to see in a movie about a character's growth. Sure. Right. But um, this is weird. Yeah. It's like she learns that you can never trust him again. And I believe that this is, you know, I bring everything back to politics. This is a neoliberal strategy to break down families. Right? Yeah. The way Disney implements it. And kids, kids, to, kids need to believe in the culture of individualism and personal empowerment and, and not, not solidarity, even with their own families. families. Ugh. No, actually, no. This I've been watching this Disney thing for a long while. It's yeah. gross. It's really yeah. gross. Right. Um, so what's what's odd about it is that uh, you know undercuts religious values, family values. You know, support for your family. Family, um, family care. Because here's the thing: when you grow this in the story arc of a child coming of age and growing yes. and reaching this new sort of new development plateau. Right. Um, you understand that grown ups have faults and shortcomings. Right. And you grow in compassion for them. 
You grow in compassion because for them. Because that's like, oh, and maybe I'm just like, you know. An idealist. Idealist or, or just like generalizing my experience. That's how it's supposed to work. But, you, no, that's, but that's what you, it's supposed to be. They get smaller, but you get bigger. But you get bigger. You know, and, or, and even. And they're still, they're, they're, they, they still have the role of your parent. Of your parent or, or grandparent or your mentor or whatever but in this sort of in this sort of cult of of uh personal empowerment. personal empowerment it's a zero-sum game and what i heard all the time was you know from friends of mine in the 90s and well if you're having trouble with your family just fuck them Leave, screw walk, them. Away. walk away never talk to them again like uh, uh, that's not the values that I hold, with, or yeah, hold a group up. Grew up with. Well, no, you might have to keep someone at arm's length, arm's length, or or whatever. But to just like say, well, I'm just never going to talk to them again. So there, that's the that's that. not that's not me. Yeah. So his his crime in the movie was that um, he wanted to retreat and regroup and plan strategy uh, because after Charles Wallace had been taken by, by it, side. by the dark side, and he realized they were fighting a force, you know, he met up with Meg mm -hmm. and realized that they were fighting a force that was too big for Hard him. Yeah. And he didn't, he was afraid, mm -hmm. didn't think, he, and he didn't want to lose Meg again or right. Calvin, you know, either. And so we need to, we need to go, we need to leave and we'll meet up with the Mrs. Watson and Mrs. Witch and Mrs. Who and plan strategy and then we'll come back. And Meg was having none of this and just looked at him with contempt at this. Right. But here's an, an odd thing about this. So um, a similar, this was parallel to something that happened earlier, which is when they realize when the witches, the Mrs. Mm -hmm. realize that her father is on Camazots like, oh, no, not Camazots. Well, we can't go to Camazots directly. We can't test her there. It's far too dangerous. It's there. It's uh, so surrounded by darkness that it destroys our uh, abilities mm -hmm. to, to be there. We can't be there. So we're going to have to go to, back to Earth right away, and, and, um, and we'll strategize. We'll make a plan. Right. They say this, and... They're leaving, and Meg defies them. And because she defies them, they wind up not tessering back to Earth. They wind up on Camazots. Right. And the witches can't stay there. They immediately, like, are dissolved away. Right. Yeah. They're not physically able to stay there. Right. But um, Meg does not turn against them. For that. For that. For saying, no, we need to... We need to this is this enemy is too big for us to take on right now we need a plan right, right? we need to regroup we need to whatever mm -hmm. so when the women say it it's cool it's cool she doesn't hold a grudge against them mm -hmm. she's upset and yeah. she defies them but when her father says it he's a coward oh. which actually is um upholding the patriarchy to say that you see what I'm saying? Patriarchal values of, of bravery. Right. That she's disgusted at her father because he doesn't have this patriarchal value of bravery at all costs, of risking his life and all their lives. All their know, lives at all costs. To rescue one kid who's in deep, deep trouble. You know? Right. He's not a Marine. Right. <laughs> it's not a never leave your buddies behind, you know? Like, right. It's, and even the Marines come up with a plan if they have to. Jesus. Right. Um, but... It's, all that said. it's crazy. So it demonizes literally the structure of the men, uh, the structure of the movie demonizes these men, this man. Right. And I don't know, call me crazy, but it seems like uh, this is a deliberate choice and part of the politics of the movie. Oh, it does seem so. Uh, it doesn't seem like, I don't, I don't remember know. that that from the book i don't think so i no. gotta read it again but i don't think the answer to liberating women of color and empowering women of color you know is to start applying a, a negative double standard to the male characters in their yeah. lives right yeah well and also i don't think i don't think upholding traditional patriarchy is precisely how you <laughs> empower women right not precisely okay but go, go so, on so I don't know. So there's that. That that was the part about the overall adaptation that kind of, like, I found the most puzzling and irritating. Like, what's that about? But overall, the the movie is very disrespectful of the source material. 
not in the sense that it deviates from it, because I'm not really opposed to no, that. No, sometimes you have to. But in the sense that it it picks and chooses little bits of it. Kind of randomly, it sounds. Semi-randomly, and just throws them back at you, <clears throat> and that, but doesn't do with them what the original story did. Mm-hmm. And so here's an example. On Kamazots, all the kids come out of their houses and they bounce balls before dinner, right? Mm-hmm. Their mom calls them into dinner. Everyone's walking in step. It's like a marching band. And they're all bouncing their balls on this beat. When mm-hmm. Meg is observing this, she's like, she starts hearing this beat echoing in her head. Right. And she's oh, God, it's pulling. It's like dragging my yeah. mind in. I'm starting to feel the pull of this, you know, beat. It's right. the beat of conformity, right? right? You know, the beating the drum for conformity and mm-hmm. um, surrender. But um, in the movie, uh, the beat is uneven. Right. right. It's fast for a while, then it slows down, then it's fast for a while. Uh, and then when they leave this part of Kamazots, when they leave this scene, it goes away. It just leaves. It right. just leaves. So in the, in the book, for their whole time in Kamazots, they can feel this beat. And every time they're seeing people, they're always moving to this to beat. To this beat. They're on the beat. Yeah. Everyone, everywhere they go. Yeah. And, um, and it's creepy. It's creepy as hell. And non-conforming kids are disappeared for reprogramming, you know, right. like they're taken to the Ministry of Love or whatever the hell it is. And uh, okay, and there's so. this bit where Charles Wallace is trying to fight this this psychic beat happening. Right. And um, he tries to recite the multiplication tables to take his mind off it. But we he finds that it's unfortunately t- very easy to recite the multiplication it's tables to, on, on, on a beat, beat, you know? And so, so there's a bit, but there's a bit in the movie where when Charles Wallace meets the man with red eyes, he starts saying the multiplication tables with him and this starts happening, but you don't hear the beat. Right. And it doesn't synchronize to the beat. And there's, that isn't even, so it's just this, thing without context Text. that comes up randomly in the next scene it's not connected to this idea that he's fighting this psychic mm-hmm. beat right uh in the book when charles wallace is captured his eyes actually like twirl to, you yeah. know these pupils mm-hmm. are like dilating in rhythm to this beat or whatnot well that might have been hard to film but they could have done something they could, have, done some freaky thing. They could have certainly done something you right. know they had 100 million dollars but and then in the in the book when um they actually meet it which in the movie they call it the it for some the ungodly it. reason rather than just it um that's it in, in the in the book it is a giant brain lying on a big slab or, uh, that mm. is pulsating. pulsing it's mm. pulsating mm. and that pulsation is, is the beat, the beat that everyone is conforming to because this thing is so powerful psychically that it has the entire society under its sway. Right. In the in the movie, when they meet it, there's the the beat thing never comes up again. Right. And because it never comes up again, like, why, was why the hell did they introduce it? What was it there for? It was a drive-by shooting at the fans of the book. Right. Yes. It's like, hey, we remember this thing from the book, the book that you love. Up. Here, take a look. You're never going to see, see it again. again. <laughs> it's really contemptuous of the source material and contemptuous of the people who love it. Who loved it. Right. And you know what? I'm a big fan of picking and choosing from the original source material the elements that you can use to, to make a good story. film. Right. To, to, to make a film that tells the story. That element right. could have been could have a been neat part of the film. Right. Instead, it was like, a Random. couple bits of it randomly selected and there's a lot more so like there's a um there's a sequence in the book where they meet a character called Aunt Beast and they recuperate on this planet where there are these big sheepdog like you know scary looking hairy hair covered aliens that right. care for Meg and turn out to be incredibly gentle and kind to them right but and so and jokes that her name in the book is Aunt, Meg should call her Aunt Beast hey, Aunt Beast <laughs> right now, in one of their flybys, later when they're tessering around, they go, the in the movie, the characters are flying past this planet, and they see, like, these 
creatures walking on long legs. They look like giant cotton balls or sheep or something. Mm -hmm. And one of the the witches, I don't remember who, says, which which says, hey, it's Ed Beast as they go by. And that's it. That's it. Right. Again, it's a drive-by shooting for fans of the 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 book. book. And now, mind you, it sounds like including Aunt Beast wouldn't have been really really told the story better yeah so there's no reason to have it there it's fine that they had to snip out that piece it's a it's a side quest if you will you know it's a digression it's sort of a healing side story thing it's nice but it's it's something that's part of the pacing of a novel that doesn't work in the pacing of a movie it's not essential you mentioned like it's it would be like we're not going to show tom bombadil in lord of the rings but we're going to mention him offhand offhand that would make no sense. Right, because he's not part of the movie. Right. Yeah. No, the thing I was, I was uh, int- inching towards and didn't quite get out a few minutes ago about uh, coming of age and growing compassion yeah. is at least for me and for people that I know, the experience is that you see that your parents, your mentors, and people you look up to are human and they make mistakes and you're like, just like me. Just like me. Oh, and that's and, that, and it's sort of like this healing. I'm not so bad. I'm I'm just like this person I admire. It it's it actually helps you to understand and accept your own faults when otherwise you might be prone to be hypercritical. Exactly when and, you realize the people yeah, that you admire yeah. are also uh, have faults and have weaknesses right. just like you do. Right, and so there's this bit when where um uh. When the witches are forced to leave Meg and Calvin and Charles Wallace on Kamazots, uh, they give them they give her gifts, mm-hmm. right? And one of them, the I think it's Mrs. What's it, uh, tells her, "I I give you the gift of your faults," mm-hmm. and it's a significant moment in the story in the book, you know. And you come to understand it later that it's the gift of being able to accept your faults, accept, accept yourself, and use them, you know. Right, like, you keep going. Right. Right. But yet, she doesn't seem, in the context of the movie, she doesn't seem willing to accept her father's faults. Father's faults. Right. And right. I suppose that's what's so, the compassion part, where you're like, yeah. oh, could I have done better in that situation? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So, you know, she does learn to have more compassion for herself and learn mm-hmm. to empower herself and all that. But, but again, it's, it's this zero sum game. It has to come at somebody else's expense. That's what it seems like. Right. That's really what it seems like. And, um, yeah, so the wave to Aunt Beast is like, um, hey, we see you. Wasn't the original story great? Now we're going to completely ignore it. <laughs> Wait, what? So, And sometimes the changes get really offensive. So there's a scene in the book where the witches mention the great figures from Earth who have fought from the light against the darkness. This is a big story arc idea. Mm-hmm. They mention Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, I think. Mm-hmm. And in the movie, they mention more people. And they mention Nelson Mandela as one of the great spiritual victors f- who fought for the light against darkness, yeah. which is a little problematic. Uh, this isn't anything against Nelson Mandela. Like, no, oh. but the people that in the book, the, the heroes that fought for light are nonviolent activists yeah. or people we at least remember that way. I mean, Gandhi may have been a shit in his personal life, but, you know, yeah. whatever. But... Nelson Mandela was not a nonviolent activist. By any stretch of the He was a terrorist. Yeah. By every definition. Like that we our use. founding fathers. We're terrorists. <laughs> By any definition. And that so you he use. just does not quite belong in, in that same, same category as the people who like, are like, you know, Muhammad, like a, a Jesus. Buddha. A, a Buddha. Right. It doesn't make any sense. So this sticks out like a sore thumb to me. And I think it's part of this neoliberal tactic of so, rebranding. Rebranding um, Nelson Mandela as a as a nonviolent peace activist. Yeah. It's Be- like the way that liberals rebrand um, Martin Luther King as a capitalist. Yeah, yeah. And not a radical. Right. You know, he's not one of those impolite black he's not, folks. He's not like, like Malcolm X, activists, you know. Activist, right. No, he's not dangerous. Well, except he did want to overthrow capitalism and found a poor people's party and, you know, get us out of the Vietnam War. All that uh, stuff. Yeah. You got to look at the whole... He started talking like that, wound up dead. I wouldn't... And I, you know, I wouldn't have had this, um, like, huh? Reaction if they had mentioned King. Right, right. Right. Because people mention King and Gandhi. They're nonviolent activists. They're explicitly religious people. This is a matter of... uh, 
a secular saint. They wanted they wanted right. to use a secular saint. Right. So I don't know. So the people who are complaining that the movie has been the book the story has been changed as some kind of neoliberal social justice warrior storyline. They're not entirely wrong. Yeah. Um. There's nothing wrong at all with Storm Reed as Meg, a a, a young actress of color. You know, she does a great job. There's nothing wrong with making the Murray family an interracial marriage. There's nothing in the book that insists that she's white. Um, You know, it's suggested kind of strangely in the in the movie that Charles Wallace has adopted, and I don't think that's mentioned no, that, in the book. That wasn't in the book that I recall. I don't recall it. And it doesn't make that a lot of sense because the whole idea is that both Meg's both parents kids. are these brilliant scientists, and so together they have this prodigy child. Right, they have these, or these, these brilliant children, right. one of whom is an, ab, an outright prodigy. Yeah, they're all brilliant, but Charles Wallace is exceptionally off the right. charts. You off know? the charts, even in his brilliant family. So, you know, people are accusing the producers of stunt casting for, like, making Meg black, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's bullshit, you know? I mean, it does well, it, it is a revision, yes, in the sense that you're seeing the book with new eyes. Yeah. But there's nothing that... Well, th- I, it's it's like the folks who are losing their minds and foaming at their mouth about Hermione Granger being black. Yeah. And <clears throat> um, if you talk to Rowling, you know, she's like, she was written ambiguously. Yes, and, deliberately. Deliberately. And, because she wanted the girls who read the book to be able to imagine themselves to imagine as themselves. Hermione. Right. Even if they were, if they were black, if they were, although maybe not Asian because she has curly hair, curly or whatever, hair. you know, right. whatever. But but you know, she she was trying to make it ambiguous enough. Right? Yes. And as I understand, Wrinkle in Time, I haven't read it recently, um, and I didn't see the movie. The, fa- the family values are pretty old school and white bread in a way. The family values are old school and white bread. Yeah. And uh, the the family is not written as. I think this this is actually not addressed. Right. I think it's assumed that they're all the same race in right. the story. Sure. But I don't think it's ad- addressed directly in any way. No, it's not. Like in any way. I don't think so. So I think you can cast it any way you'd like. Yeah. And frankly, I think casting uh, Charles Wallace as adopted is is more of that same, more of the same. Yeah. More of the same yeah. sort of like uh, reflecting more modern families I in suppose, the story. I suppose. But it's, it stands out a little bit as odd. But you know there is a piece of stunt casting in the the uh, in the movie. Yeah, what's the stunt casting? And this is there's a character there's a minor character in the original book called the Happy Medium. Right. And they go to a planet to meet the Happy Medium, and she reads their future. And it's like she uses a crystal ball. I don't remember the details. I have to mm-hmm. say to help them find Meg's father. Where is right. he? Right. In the movie, they cast Zach Galifianakis as the happy medium because his gender is not important. Like, the gender of this character is not important. Right. It, it is funny, but he is funny. He's a funny guy. Yeah. Right? But his character is really pointless. And the scenes he's in are oh. long and drag out and... They don't really add much to, they don't the, add story, to, they don't add to the story, honestly. Right, right. So, well, I, I think that the idea of uh, sort of reflecting modern families yeah, um, is certainly worthwhile to connect with an audience, right? Yes. Um, but I think it, it's only valuable to the point that it adds to the story for the viewer and doesn't take away from the story. Yeah. Like if it's a little yeah. too awkward and... Like, right not part of the story that's being told yeah it's just like distracting the the, the zach galifianakis says the happy medium it's not um offensive exactly it's just it's in the way a little pointless yeah. and but the these scenes the way they were written and put together would be a little pointless with a female happy medium too sure sure so i don't know so i i don't find any of what was done with the casting and all that to be like actually offensive. Offensive or problematic. Uh, But I do find it offensive that we actually throw all the Christian allegorical elements of the story uh, out in a way that renders the story fairly incoherent. Well, incoherent and and neutral. Yeah. It's so Christian. But it's it's weirder. It gets, oh, it's weirder. It gets weirder. There's more. (laughs) Oh my God. I'm sorry. We're getting through this as quickly as possible. Hour uh, three. 
When we meet Oprah, and I'm not going to say that Oprah was a stunt casting. I will say that she was a strategic casting decision. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Because if you're going to invest in Oprah, you expect to get some investment back in audience, audience attendance, attendance, right? That's right. Um, when we first see her, we're actually uh, she's actually 40 feet tall. So the witches have manifested on Earth, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, Oprah shows up. She's ma manifesting for the first time in Meg's backyard, and I don't she's know, about red forty. One. She's towering over everyone else. She's doesn't have a good sense of scale. Right. Wait. No, wait so is she like the size of a redwood? She's or? huge. She's like, I don't, she's. I think she's above the like the the light the power lines you know i don't know oh, exactly. hey. she's really she's ridiculously enormous right you know and i don't know this just she dominates the movie when she's on the screen and i think that that was a deliberate like metaphor for that right you right. know <laughs> it's now, like and you know this was a hundred million dollar film and you get the sense that oh that's where the money went you know i don't know how much names. they paid her but certainly big names yeah, well, she's not bad in the movie. You know, she's a good actress, but her character is just this like self help guru. Well, maybe she's just playing herself. <sighs> Pretty much. Mm -hmm. That's what people say. She's just playing Oprah. And her outfits are distracting because every scene where we see her, she's wearing a different outfit. Every time. Well, are the other witches wearing different outfits? Every not time? necessarily. Mm. I don't know. Um, there's another weird bit where. Where uh, Mrs. Watsit winds up changing into a giant flying lettuce leaf. Mm. Um, where in, in the book she, they change into some kind of true form, which is a centaur like, uh, like a very noble looking, genderless, like beautiful creature. flying horse creature. Right, right. right. Instead, she turns into this giant lettuce leaf. But as she does it, she does it by spinning around and all her clothes fly off. And you don't see it on, on the screen. But Calvin is like, oh my, this is what's it? Because she's suddenly naked. And right. that is so out of keeping with the tone of the of the, the, the book. book, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, I guess it's funny, but... I, I, th I think they were trying to push the hippie narrative about the right. the, the, the witches like, to its logical yeah. end. Because you know, at some point the hippies are going to be naked. So... But the thing is, so that was one of the effects. She's turned into this flying um, lettuce, leaf. lettuce leaf, and the kids ride on her up into the upper. Wait, lettuce leaf? She yeah. turns into a, a lettuce leaf yeah. to let them leave? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't do that, did they? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, you're gonna kill me! I didn't. That didn't occur to me. Let us leave. Uh, or a giant people call it a giant kale leaf or something. She's like a flying plant. Right? Okay, uh, but um, uh, sure. And somehow the kids ride on her, even though she looks very slippery, and there are no handholds. You know, cool. as it as uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. See, so, the centaurs made more sense. They're three kids, three right, centaurs. They, they fly away. Well, they all ride on one, but they're they're really big. Oh, they're huge. But the idea was they wanted to take the kids up up into the upper atmosphere of Uriel so they could see the um, the encroaching influence of, of it. Of it, yeah. Of Camazots, right. So uh, the movie looks cheap and visually inconsistent all over the place. There's all this color correction happening on Uriel. Um, it looks like it took... $10 million to make it, not $100 million. Oh, it looks like it was shot as a personal project over the course oh. of a few years with it. Like every, every year the, the producer would get some, like a vanity project almost. Like the, mm -hmm. the producer would get some more film and find a new art director to work on it, mm -hmm. which would explain why the art and Kept sets changing. are so crazily inconsistent from one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, the way things happen on sets is very confusing. You're never sure where you are. Oh. On Camazots, nothing, instead of actually going from place to place, everything like changes around them as if it were out there in the matrix and they just like push a button and <laughs> reset the scene. Right. Uh, there's this big sequence with like a giant tornado uprooting trees and everything. The trees flying all over the place, dirt flying all over the place. And it doesn't make any damn sense. It's like, why happening. is this happening? It's just happening. Okay. It, it's not ever explained why this is happening. Um, when they are on sets, you know, when they are like in certain scenes, some of the scenes look really cool, but mm -hmm. a lot of the sets like the, the crystal planet where the happy medium lives in a cave, they look bad. Oh, yeah. They just look 
cramped and weird and bad. Mm. It's like you're inside a museum or something, and it's not well lit, you know? Like an ugly museum. Yeah, and you don't... When they go from set to set or place to place, Mm -hmm. you rarely have a sense for where you are. Um, Mm -hmm. And when they're traveling, like the traveling effect through the Tesseract is not... It's just weird. It's not really convincing. It doesn't give you a sense of adventure. It's adventure not even wonder. Like it's not even as cool as the Stargate, you know, effect. Oh, that's pretty cool though. Right. So they didn't even it's like has elements of that, but when Meg Tessers, she always just blacks out. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> which is a little funny, but um like she's our point of view character largely, right? right? So when she is going to test her, we want to follow her and see what she sees, but she just blacks out yeah. usually. And then she's waking up and we see her waking up in a field of some, on some field planet. Of poppies. Uh, it's quite annoying. And in fact, when she finally flies back, she has a trouble testering and that's from the book actually yeah, that, yeah. that she always like, she, it's, it's not good with the testering. She's, she's, she's learning a new skill. Uh, yeah. Um, but in the, so in the movie, the final when they finally fly back to Earth, Meg takes over and leads the tessering because mm-hmm. she's gotten good at it now. And they show her flying through literally waves of billowing cloth like you see used in rhythmic gymnastics mm-hmm. and uh, sparkles like um, glitter and confetti. Glitter and confetti. Like moving in slow motion as if she's on a wire, flying through a wire, through smoke, uh, cloth, these these like streamers of cloth, glitter and confetti. And that's her trans her transformation, like her movement back home. Yeah. And it's so puzzling why they did that. It looks like something you'd see in a com- like a community theater bit. We're right. tessering and so the lights, they use a lighting effect and they, you know... Now, mind a fan you, effect or whatnot. I can imagine this being sort of a low key. It's not. We're not going to do the big blow up scene. We're, we're not going to yeah. do like the like the, the Stargate, Stargate effect. effect. We're just going to like do this old school, and it's like you're flying in your dreams, and it's cool, and that's how. But then the whole movie would have to be low key in the same way. Right, right. So it it's so part, I could see it, but it would have to be the whole. This film. This is what I was saying about inconsistency. So like parts of it seem like an art film. Yeah. Like and if it was an art film and this is how they test her, like that's cool. That's, that's pretty. Cool. That's you pretty, know, yeah. it's like. But it just it has this feeling of having had rewrites and script doctors and reshoots and cuts and all that. A lot and of fights and drama. Uh, fights and drama. So. A lot of drama. And, and it's pretty clear that they knew they had a mess. And when I say that, I mean, like, it already has a 42% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, which is pretty damn low. That's pretty low. Um, like, that's the, what, that's that's the review? critic review. What, the, what's the view? What's the audience review? 37 or oh. something like that. Yeah. That's and so, um, you know something has gone wrong when you sit down and the film opens and you're seeing the director talking to you, saying, hi, I'm the director of... I'm." What's her name? Eva uh, DuVernay. Uh, I'm the director of A Wrinkle in Time. We had a great time shooting this movie, and I just want to introduce you to some of the many people that helped make it happen. And they show some clips, like from the making of documentary, right? Right. That's probably going to be on the DVD, you know, yep. of people running around a hillside with digital cameras and all this, you know. Right. And she's like, and, you know, we had such a great time, and it was so empowering and wonderful experience and all this. Hope and, you enjoy it. And then, yeah, and then she's leaving you like, look at all these wonderful people who worked so hard on this film. You wouldn't want to hurt those people, would you? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of person are you? You wouldn't want to hurt their feelings. feelings. They worked hard. It's weird. And yeah, it's yeah. like, and you and this happened, and I'm like, oh, oh. boy. This is where we're starting. Yeah. Okay. And no, that, I've often said, you know, if, if the director's got to explain it to me. Yeah. It, but she's not explaining anything, but it's like this. Or like this set, the, set the stage or do the introduction. The I don't need to hear from it, you and once is, the movie's done. The movie can't stand on sound. It also has, it has these pop songs dropped in at, at emotional peak moments it's, that seem like they were added later. And in fact, reading it, I was like, oh, yeah, they originally had an or- like a, an orchestral orchestra. score. But they took that away, fired the the soundtrack guy, the orchestra guy, yeah, and Ooh. assigned a new music 
guy for it who used all these pop songs, right? Oh. And like, okay. And then the end credits are in a completely different style, which you're watching them as like, hey, this is really cool. It's like these whole new movie. fractalized Photoshop effects of pictures of all the cast. It was something. Right. And you're like, yeah, wouldn't it have been cool if some of that art direction had made it into the, the movie? movie? Yeah. <sighs> So it feels like there's a lot, uh, there's a lot wrong with it. I still kind of recommend it. That's what's frustrating, <clears throat> because it's an interesting failure. You should set your expectations low if you know the book. Mm -hmm. um, I think it will probably work reasonably well with a target demographic who don't aren't like film critics. You know, oh, yeah, thirteen year old girls, twelve year old girls. Our daughter Veronica is thirteen and she's biracial, or you know, she's a. a a girl, a young girl of color, you know, young woman of color. Mm -hmm. um, she enjoyed it mostly, but I did ask her. She said she felt like there were scenes missing that would have helped it make sense. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Like important stuff was cut out. The movie's one hour forty nine minutes, which really isn't that long. It feels long, but it feels slow. Yeah. And um, I like the fact that some of the scenes move slowly like the director really gave the scene a chance to sort of breathe and follow an organic pacing mm -hmm. especially some of the most emotional scenes between meg and her father they just let the film run for a while right they last a couple minutes and you can really see all these emotions playing out on their faces right that's fine but it's all the scenes that are like unnecessary that and that make still it, makes sense that that don't really contribute to a tight story arc that make it feel long mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know um there will probably be a director's cut with commentary and deleted scenes and i'm actually curious about that i'd like to see what yeah. could be done with it and maybe I'd, I'd really like to hear the story of why what went wrong you know that let me just say but you yeah you, you probably won't hear right. an honest account by the director because if she wants to work in this town again you'll keep that quiet she'll keep that quiet but you get the feeling that there was a lot of interference or something uh, or something I don't know. maybe people didn't like what she was doing with it they tried to punch it up they tried to take it away from her or whatever but or whatever I, yeah hard to say. we don't know but it, it definitely feels like a too many cooks thing mm -hmm. yeah okay so that's yeah, my brief that's review rad. of a wrinkle in time <laughs> we have a flexible <laughs> meaning for the word brief you've been listening to the grace and paul podcast uh, check out the show blog at potscast.blogspot.com. You can leave comments there, uh, or you can search for the Grace and Paul Potscast on Facebook or on YouTube. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah, see you next time. Bye-bye.